नमस्कार थैंक यू वेरी मच अगेन फॉर कमिंग हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू आर कमिंग फर्स्ट टाइम दिस दिस ईयर मंथ डिड नॉट कम लास्ट मंथ लास्ट वीक ओके थैंक यू थैंक यू फॉर कमिंग एंड हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू केम लास्ट वीक एंड डिड नॉट कम टूडे क्वाइट अ फ्यू ऑफ यू एक्चुअली बट थैंक यू देर आर हियर देर हियर आर वी लाइव ऑन यूट्यूब सर वी आर लाइव ऑन यूट्यूब डू वी हैव अ लिंक सेंट रचिरा ओके first we play a game dr aruna pujari is here she is a microbiologist and will be g- giving us the first talk we welcome you dr aruna pujari with your permission we'll do a 15 minute game and uh, uh, yeah so in this game i'll ask uh, some people to stand up and answer a medical question and some questions are medical some are funny so i'll start with this one all those who have real plants in their bedroom please stand up who have real plants in their bedroom please stand up okay nice yeah please stand up sir you are don't hesitate if you are you know acha they are not real okay okay you only those who are standing will answer this question please do not prompt if possible before it was detected as a sweetener this molecule was made for to be an in- insecticide which molecule am i talking about before it was introduced as a sweetener aspartame is incorrect we will we will give it to dr bhagat uh, dr rathod sorry uh, he said stevia first please give a prize to dr deepak rathod <laughs> it is sucralose sucralose was you know how how sildenafil was first tried for uh, cardiac disease angina and then it was discovered to be uh, something for erectile dysfunction similarly sucralose was first being done for as an insecticide and then it was discovered to be a sweetener all those who have used lots of swear words in indian languages in their college days please stand up <laughs> plenty meaning har ek sentence mein aata tha kuch to bhi all those who have used a lot of swear words in their college days even school days and uh, suddenly had to stop after marriage <laughs> please stand up okay there is only we'll give a prize acha ha ha ji you are still giving okay no problem we are, we, we have to i would like you to not prompt this answer okay hmm. which england cricketer has publicly spoken about his mental health issues ben stokes, ben stokes is the correct answer and you know why the prompt was there <laughs> okay ben stokes okay, i must tell you lalo chizia is a medical term which means relieving stress by using foul language l o l a l o c h e z i a that is the spelling you wanted right not the any other one ha huh. okay all those who were here last time and slept off at least for some time during the talk please stand up <laughs> no 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 punishment will be given just stand up sorry okay your question remember the the prompt that makes you stand up is also a hint to the question that you realized if single tus is a medical term for hiccups what is oscitation what is oscitation a medical term for not snoring but you have you have you are on the path no yes sir 
downward movement of the head. No, it is slightly upward movement. If you can tell me now. Okay, no prizes, it is yawning. Yawning is oscillation and pandiculation is yawning with your arm stretched. That is pandiculation. Okay. All those who strongly favor the death penalty for major sexual offenders. Please stand up. Death penalty for major sexual offenders. Oh, quite a few. Okay. Your question. If the guillotine was invented by a doctor, which it was, a French doctor, which kind of medical person invented the electric chair? What medical speciality person invented the electric chair used for death penalties? Anesthetist, no? Psychiatrist, cardiologist? Dentist, somebody said dentist? I will give it to you. Dentist, she's a dentist, okay. Dentist, uh, you know, they have chairs. And we will, uh, yeah. Next time, yeah, next time you go to a dentist, sit gingerly. All those who have eloped and married, please stand up. Eloped and married, or eloped and stayed together, may not have married. Anybody eloped? Anybody? Okay. All those who married against the strong op opposition of parents. Very strong opposition of parents. Okay. This couple, I can ask this couple, what happened, sir? <laughs> Whose parents first? Your parents. And what was the opposition? Community, Community opposition. And then how did you convince? Because you, didn't, you did not elope. Time is healed. You, so you married without their presence. Oh, wow. So that is elopement. Yeah. Okay. Big round of applause for them. Yeah. Now please stand up. Please stand up. Your question is coming up. In which movie does Sanjeev Kumar walk out of his rich father's house, get married, have five children, and then die of tuberculosis? Okay, they are prompting. People are prompting, so we'll not take that. Thank you. <laughs> Please sit down. Thank you. Try Parichai. Parichai is a Gulzar movie. Sare ke sare gama ko lekar wala gana. Okay. All those who have a cat as a, sorry, who have a cat as a pet. Please stand up. Past tense ho gaya. Sir, please stand up. Jayesh bhai, can you stand up? And you can also stand up, had wala. Those who had in the past is also, is okay. Okay, we have at least three of you. Your question, please don't prompt. Please, they will deserve a prize. 250 milligrams of which common drug can kill a cat? Oh, Judge by got that right. Paracetamol, 250 milligram can kill a cat. Well done, sir. <laughs> Mare to yahan the. All those who dream in color and not black and white, or at least occasionally dream in color and realize that they have dreamt in color, please stand up. Beach one. <laughs> Fifty shades of gray may dream. Aata hai. <laughs> Wo theme hai dream ka. Okay. All those who are dreaming in color are standing. What happened in 1982 which made more Indians dream in color? We will give it to you, Dr. Bagadia, Dr. Shukla could doing a thing a prize. Color TV is the correct answer. Sorry, I may not have heard some answers from here. Uh, introduction of color TV basically made people dream more in color, which was an unusual phenomenon. Okay. Next, all those who have consistently lied about their school or college performance to their parents. Please stand up. Consistently lied about results, what happened in school, masti kiya, chupaya. Please stand up. Wow. So many liars here. 
all those who consistently lied about their school performance, school attendance, college performance, college attendance, eve teasing in classes, etc., who lied to their parents, please stand up. नहीं किया कुछ नहीं किया तो फिर मैं क्वेश्चन सबको पूछता हूँ every everybody which part of the human body is regularly ignored by the occipital lobe in all waking hours nose somebody said nose who said nose nose is dr bagadia again uh, we will give a prize to dr bagadia again nose is consistently ignored by the occipital lobe despite it being in the field of vision all the time okay all those who cannot tolerate calcium because of constipation please stand up so calcium supplement huh calcium calcium any salt calcium any carbonate or cit citrate if you don't tolerate please stand up okay your question what kind of medicine for constipation was amitabh bachchan taking in the film piku lactulose no anybody anima is up goal no it was homeopathy it was homeopathy he was taking homeopathy which nakswami or what i don't know but he was taking homeopathy thank you so much and all those who in a wedding reception dinner start with desserts please stand up it's less crowded on that table right so many people ha huh, you can stand up once is enough 1 2 3 4 5 6 at least once is enough once is enough ha ah, starting with desserts what is the what is the reason sir acha what is the reason for starting with dessert do you do it regularly you like that more less crowd in the on the table yeah your question name the billionaire who drinks at least 5 cans of coca cola and loves mcdonalds buffet buffet warren buffet is the correct answer devish and the last question all those who had a large collection of dolls in their childhood large collection large i will define as 5 or more dolls in their childhood please stand up only one male standing so far one female yeah four five large collection of dolls people are trying to recollect whether they did have retrograde or anterograde kya bolte usko okay your question a cosmetic surgery fad involving botox injected in the trapezii both the trapezius muscles is an ongoing fad in the west the reason is it makes the neck look longer as the trape barbie neck is the correct answer and uh, barbie botox is the injection uh, a price to dr shukla okay uh, i think we are out of prizes dr shukla hey, hey. <laughs> okay we will keep it for the next game and meanwhile uh, may I, may I present dr aruna pujari please come on the stage अनदर प्लॉस प्लीज फॉर डॉक्टर अरुणा हुज कम फ्रॉम आई थिंक कंदिवली आइए ना प्लीज दिस विल बी योर माइक जस्ट टेस्ट इट वंस हेलो हेलो थोड़ा सा वॉल्यूम इनका बढ़ा देंगे हेलो ओके डॉक्टर अरुणा हेड्स द माइक्रोबायोलॉजी एंड अ सेक्शन ऑफ पैथोलॉजी एट ब्रिज कैंडी हॉस्पिटल हाउ मेनी इयर्स इन आर इंट्रोडक्शन इज थ्रू टॉकिंग विद यू ओके हाउ मेनी इयर्स इन ब्रिज कैंडी आई हैव बीन अराउंड 16 इयर्स इन ब्रिज कैंडी एंड इज दिस योर फर्स्ट corporate job no i was at bscs actually prior to that for about 1 year and 8 months uh, as lab in charge uh, bscs hospital andheri 
uh, which I started immediately after my post-graduation at KEM. And then I moved to BCH. And uh, are you married? No, I'm not married. <laughs> and you live with? My parents. Wow. At, in Gandhivli? Yes. And uh, how's, why 18 years or how, how so long in Bridge Candy? I'm not sure. I think I just kept uh, getting a good environment to work better and uh, make some difference in the field of microbiology and infection prevention and control, which are my core subjects. Um, and I believe I have a great team. So, Was the presence of Dr. Farooq Udwadia a factor? Tremendous. I think my first 10 years, close to 10, 11 years, I have taken rounds with him every day wow. in the ICU between um, 9 o'clock to 10.30, sometimes more than that. And uh, we still discuss a lot of problems, uh, even today, about patients. I think that was one turning point that, has actually made me a clinical microbiologist, so I just don't give out reports. I am not happy just giving out reports before, uh, meaning if there's any problem, I would first uh, go back to the patient, try and find out what's going on, speak to everyone who's concerned, uh, whether be it a surgeon, be it a physician, be it a pediatrician. I think I've, I have some wonderful clinical uh, colleagues who have uh, helped me grow in this journey of mine. Uh, we have been encouraging, uh, all the, this audience comprises chiefly of family physicians. Some students are there. But we have been kind of uh, telling them that you do interact with the pathologist more than you interact with the microbiologist. And that should change. Should I think it should. <laughs> we interact more with both, with the entire lab, I think. You know, don't just take a result. I, I can give you one example of uh, one of our very senior pediatricians, uh, Dr. Niru Vitlani. And I think she is the one person who has taught me so much of community medicine. And uh, she's, uh, meaning if there is a result and she does not understand, uh, she will call me at any point during day, evening, late evening, even sometimes at 11 o'clock. And uh, I'm so grateful to her that she values what results we give. She wants to understand uh, why this is important and uh, what should be treated probably. Because there's so much of new technology that has come in and uh, sometimes uh, they may, everything may not be really important. So uh, that interaction is very, very crucial both for her as well as for me. I think for me because she sees so many patients at her end and uh, based on that information, I, I, I am able to give her a better advice. Absolutely. So how many of you uh, think that the subject that we are discussing today, multiplex PCR, uh, is something that you don't know much about? How many of you think so that? Okay, so we are here to learn from you because this is a nascent area, this is an area which is evolving and this is an area which is useful to the family physician, not just to the uh, in-hospital uh, person. So what we will discuss today is mainly with the focus of outdoor medicine. As, as you know, indoor medicine is a great uh, uh, role in molecular bi biology, but outdoor medicine is what we will. So, uh, uh, I have tried to introduce them with some terminology, but I would like to know from you, uh, what is an antibiotic stewardship? So antibiotic stewardship uh, in very simple and plain terms would be using the right drug at the right time in the right dose for the right duration. These four, five things. Um, so traditionally we always thought that uh, an antimicrobial agent should be given for five days minimum. That's not what it is really today. For some um, diseases or infections, you might want to give it just for three days based upon meaning there are enough guidelines and uh, guidelines try to focus on uh, what is the minimum duration that will still cure. And um, uh, we don't want to exceed giving an antimicrobial agent even for one more day. Why? Because there is a lot of collateral damage that happens when you give antimicrobial agents. I, I don't think we ever think about collateral damage that antimicrobial agents can cause uh, when we prescribe antimicrobial agents. So why I'm talking about antimicrobial agents and not antibiotics is because, you know, meaning it may be an antiparasitic agent, but it can cause a lot more damage to other, other things in the body, and particularly gut flora. So uh, if uh, I'm sure everybody has heard about Clostridium uh, difficile related infections. So they say that even a single shot of oral antimicrobial agent or an IV antimicrobial agent can actually completely disturb the flora in the gut and lead to over multiplication of CD 
and cause a CDI. And we know CDI has a very huge spectrum and uh, about three years ago, uh, NHSN or the CDC described community acquired CDI also. So from that point of view, I think, you know, we need to be very much aware of uh, the plenty of collateral damage that an antimicrobial agent can cause and all of us should really be concerned about antimicrobial stewardship. It's not a topic which, you know, to be talked about only in institutions. I think that's where we are going wrong. So we have a program actually with Kumar and Mukesh, we have uh, devised a program called Outpatient Antibiotic Stewardship. And uh, we, we would like, some people have already participated and we would like you to participate in the next programs. What about, what is diagnostic stewardship? So diagnostic stewardship is uh, basically, uh, you know, based upon your clinical examination, what is your thought process as differential diagnosis and trying to uh, investigate the patient only for those conditions. And then based on the results of those further either ruling in or ruling out. So again, this is something which is very simple. Don't do extensive investigations without having a differential diagnosis in mind. I think that's the traditional way that we have been thought, but somewhere or the other, uh, because uh, uh, there are so many, so many diagnostic modalities now available, easily available, may not always be expensive that you, we, we tend to, okay, ye bhi kar dete, ye bhi kar dete, waisa. So keep, uh, the primary focus still remains on good clinical examination history, and then based on that, have a DD, set of DD, and then investigate. That's what is um, a diagnostic stewardship. And again, it's not only about clinicians, it's also about us in the lab. Because for us, if we uh, get a set of investigations and from there, if something points out to uh, one or the other infection, we are supposed to communicate with you and let you know, okay, okay, this is pointing towards this. And is there something else to consolidate that fact? Because uh, we need to have objective evidence now, mainly for medical legal purposes, we need to have objective evidence. So my role um, as a laboratorian would be to communicate with my clinical colleagues and let them know, okay, this is, this is probably either final or maybe we can do something else or this is pointing towards this, what do you think? So uh, diagnostic stewardship is not only about clinical teams but also about laboratory teams. So diagnostic stewardship, the word stewardship means kind of keeping, a, keeping an eye corrective eye on everything. And diagnostic stewardship complements antibiotic stewardship because diagnostic stewardship tells you what is the organism and whether in such an organism an antibiotic is worthy of giving or not at all. So both are complementary to each other. One thing about diagnostic stewardship, why is it important and why molecular testing becomes important in diagnostic stewardship is the turnaround time. So what is the turnaround time? So if you really look at uh, uh, these multiplex PCRs that we have currently, they are closed system PCRs and you might get a result as early as less than probably one and a half hours. Some of our turnaround time is 45 minutes. We never thought of that probably a decade ago. I myself being a microbiologist, when I was training, uh, we were used to do PCRs. In fact, I, nev I didn't learn PCR during my training. But whatever PCRs were available at that point in time were all, uh, you know, the clinical ones were probably uh, one or two days. And the research ones were working towards, you know, less than that. But uh, uh, the last decade has really, really, you know, boosted how we, how we diagnose infections through molecular uh, systems. And you can now get results even within 45 minutes. So one example, clinical example is, I used to, in a patient with acute fever during monsoon, where I send malarial parasite, peripheral smear, I said some dengue test, and I know turnaround time is maybe a day. I would empirically give artemisinin in combination therapy, saying that this might be malaria, let us not wait. Now, with the turnaround time being two hours, four hours, I can safely withhold the anti-malarial, see whether it is dengue or malaria, and therefore uh, uh, not waste the ACT because ACT resistance is going to come and therefore we have to reduce our ACT use. So that is just one example. So turnaround time is becoming shorter. That is one big thing in diagnostic stewardship. Uh, let us take now some cases which they face because clinical situations will be important for them. In the monsoon, we have in our city at least ma malaria, dengue, leptospirosis, enteric fever, uh, chikungunya, occasionally some other uncommon diseases. We have these diseases, 
our clinical diagnosis is fairly certain in some cases. For example, I don't think chikungunya will be missed by all of us, but leptospirosis may be missed by all of us. So now, how in monsoon, how should they use uh, the fever panel as they call it? So if a patient comes to you within probably five days of the fever, uh, in fact, first three days, I would say, you know, because that's the most crucial Sensitive. time where yeah, the organisms will be present. So these PCRs are actually antigen based. as They are going to pick up the DNA or RNA of the, uh, the bug. So in bacteria, we have both DNA and RNA, whereas viruses can either be DNA or RNA. That kit already has whatever um, details it has to pick up. So um, in the first three days, and if it is the picture is blur, which could happen with a lot of tropical disease clinical presentations, uh, one could ask for a fever profile, which is based on tropical diseases, and you will get results of enteric fever, lepto, dengue, chick. Um, scrub, I think scrub is also something important and uh, the history of maybe travel for camping or some things like that would also help. In fact, in, uh, Mumbai is endemic for scrub also uh, the, amongst the rickettsial diseases. So rickettsia is also part of that particular panel. And occasionally we've had patients who are positive with even rickettsia. So uh, in the first three days before the antibody formation happens, the organism is present in the blood. Once the antibodies form, these organisms usually, you know, they'll be destroyed by the, uh, by the antibodies, which is a natural mechanism of the body. So the first three, four days would be an ideal time to actually ask for uh, a tropical fever panel. And the results most laboratories would give you in, uh, let's say, six to eight hours. Let us discuss each infection within the tropical panel and see the sensitivity, specificity, vis-a-vis -vis the traditional methods. Which one should I go first? Dengue. So uh, in, in our regular practice, we have been doing dengue NS1 antigen first four days or so. Fifth day onwards, we do dengue IgM. Sometimes we do dengue IgG, especially in the younger patient. Uh, now we have dengue PCR in the multiplex panel. First, uh, first question, can we do just dengue single PCR, meaning single yes, plex? Can. Yes, we yes. can. It is available. Okay. So uh, now tell us comparison between sensitivity, specificity of NS1 and PCR, which are both done in the first few days. So uh, um, thankfully for dengue, the NS1, if you do it by ELISA, um, uh, if the techniques are good, then the sensitivity uh, for the PCR would be, let's say, somewhere around even 90% or so, actually. And NS1 as an ELISA is also good sensitivity um, uh, because uh, it's been a technique that has been there for a long time and you're picking up an antigen, you're not picking up an antibody. So um, if, you, uh, if you have a, a PCR, our experience at least uh, in the past, we've started doing the, this particular panel for the last uh, uh, around five, six years. It's been very, very rewarding for dengue and chick. So dengue is, uh, is really good. Dengue PCRs PCR are really good. good. Yes. Yes, they're really good in the first three or four days. What we sometimes clinically see is in the first day if we send NS1, hmm. we may not can but get But the it. PCR will pick up. PCR will pick up on the first day itself. Yes, it picks up. And so the cost difference between PCR and NS1, I, I am not sure, but about there a thousand rupees. There would definitely rupees. be a cost difference of at least around three to four thousand of rupees. Itna, maybe. Itna huh. Even if you do Depends. single plex. Huh. In, single plex would be somewhere around four thousand uh, plus. Because see, if you do a single plex also, of course it would depend upon the number of uh, um, samples so. we have. But uh, uh, even if I have one sample, I would give priority to do that because it is an important result to be communicated, I will need to use positive negative controls in this situation. Like my closed systems, uh, closed system PCRs, they have an inbuilt control, but these are open system PCRs which require positive negative control. So for one test, I'm running three tests actually. Okay, so if I send it to say Bridge Candy Hospital, my patient goes there, gets the blood collected. How soon can I expect the report or should I call up and find the report? Mm, so usually if, if the patient comes uh, by let's say around even 2, 2.30, sometimes we stretch out, stretch out on that also, we'll give you the same day results in about uh, four to six hours. So four to six hours will it turn around. And NS1 turnaround time? At this moment, the, from this year, Jan, my NS1 turnaround time is one hour. At any point in time, 24 by 7. So in dengue, early days, turnaround time is not a big advantage. 
So now can we can we decide when do we send NS1 and when do we send dengue PCR? So I think with respect to dengue, um, your NS1 ELISA is still a good option because these days we have automated ELISAs also. As I said, you know, till last year I didn't have an automation on that ELISA. I would, Saturday, Sunday would be a major suffering <laughs> to everybody, including to us also because Monday then we would have to do a whole batch of ELISAs. Today, 24 by 7, we are doing uh, dengue NS1 IgM IgG. Um, on an automation and uh, we don't wait for any batches. So I am able to give you a result in probably one, one and a half hours. Okay. Uh, the next infection, anybody? Chick. Malaria, let's okay. take malaria. Uh, in malaria, we normally send either peripheral smear, thick and thin slides. Is that a thing of the past? So, um, not at all. Not the at thin all. smears are not at all a thing of the past and I think they play a very important role even now because um, it gives you parasite density, it gives you uh, the which type of parasite it is and it gives you a good prognostic uh, value and um, uh, which the PCR will not be able to match at least for now. So um, uh, thick smears, I'm not sure how many labs are really doing thick smears, but uh, thin smears are part and parcel and protocol of every laboratory. And even rapid now. malarial gives us the species. Rapid but malarial. But doesn't give us the density. Yes, it doesn't give you the density. Also with FALSI, the rapid malarial, the HRP2 cannot, is not a, uh, it does not have prognostic significance, un unlike the LDH. LDH has prognostic significance because only multiplying uh, malarial parasites will produce LDH. But HRP2 is a protein which will be present even with dead organisms, so you can't, that part of it does not have prognostic significance. So what she's saying is the rapid malarial test uses a certain uh, chemical which will pick up even dead falciparum. And there, are there LDH based Rapid yes, yes. tests also. Yes, yes. So usually your rapid RDTs of malaria, which have been, uh, you know, meaning actually um, uh, um, recommended by WHO, have LDH and HRP2. So histidine-rich protein is usually used for falciparum, okay. actually, and LDH is used for all all okay. malaria, ma mainly vivax that we have. So typically, here. our labs would keep what? It's on the same kit, sir. It's on the same kit. Okay. Uh, we have many point of care kits available mm. for malaria and even dengue. Uh, should we use them in the clinical practice? So chromatography based point of care kits um, don't have as much sensitivity. So it's not the same for malaria. Malaria WHO also has recommended and uh, I actually speaking, the ones that WHO recommends, they've looked at the same, they've done validation for sensitivity specificity, that sensitivity should be at least 90%. But currently in the Indian market, you will find so many different kits. types of kits and what kind of antigens they use to pick up these, uh, you know, um, uh, these uh, tests, these particular parasites, we really don't know the quality of antigens. And that is where it might suffer. Otherwise, um, malaria RDT plays a very important role today in rapid diagnosis along with the thin smears. Uh, when it comes to dengue, it is very clear. Don't use dengue rapid kits. Don't use. So whatever, they really lack of sen sensitivity and uh, uh, it will mislead, basically. Not, should not be used. Now let's go to PCR, malaria. So malaria PCR versus slides or rapid tests? So uh, malaria PCR, uh, I feel that it should be used as a part of the panel rather than a single malaria PCR because your uh, um, uh, thin smears are and RDTs are very easily available. Uh, there's a lot of experience uh, that we have working on it. Besides, they have prognostic significance, whereas your PCR does not have. No PCR has prognostic significance unless it is a viral, uh, unless it is a load determining uh, PCR. Uh, but what we do for these PCRs, are they are just qualitative, positive, negative, detected, not detected. Does the malaria PCR differentiate falciparum uh, and vivax? So primarily, uh, they will not, but there are PCRs which will distinguish between um, uh, falciparum and vivax, we have to do a second step for it. Mm -hmm. Unless your lab has a reflex protocol that go ahead yeah, and do ye haan, ye karo. But um, my lab doesn't have, I'm not sure how many more people yeah, have. So unlikely. Uh, number of days for which malaria PCR remains positive, approximately. So uh, 
this is one problem with PCRs is that it has it does not have prognostic significance and uh, the, the DNA of the malarial parasite can remain in the blood for much longer than the parasite has already gone destroyed and killed. Uh, so it can be positive for as as long as one and a half two months also. Oh wow! Okay, so we may be misled there. Yes. Okay, uh, we go to chikungunya. Uh, we know that chikungunya IgM takes some time. How much time? So any antibody uh, to uh, to be produced would take at least a minimum of about five days to seven days. Um, so chick is the same. Uh, and uh, there is where the role of PCR comes with chikungunya. So you can't do, if a patient presents to you between one to, let's say, four or five days, uh, doing chick IgM is no use. Why doesn't chick have a antigen like the NS1 or dengue? They've not been able to characterize a specific antigen for chick, unfortunately. Okay. okay. So uh, you would recommend to do PCR of chick on the first day of fever also? If you strongly suspect, go ahead, yes. Yes. Uh, most of us, I think, clinically diagnose chikun chikungunya very well, but sometimes for the patient's conviction, we may, we may do, and sometimes also we want to know the closest differential diagnosis for chikungunya probably will be reactive arthritis and, uh, you know, post-gastroenteritis, etc. Therefore, uh, you may have to just prove chikungunya that it is, this is chikungunya, because prognostically they are both very different diseases. So, uh, and chikungunya PCR would remain positive for how long? Uh, so till antibody production. There's no point in doing chikungunya PCR in the second week. No, okay. it's a It's a test for probably five days and less. Okay. So is there any PCR which is useful beyond five days? Yes. Um, so lepto remains there for some time. Okay. Um, uh, then uh, even malaria remains there for some time. So malaria, if you have missed, probably, you then uh, these could be, yes. But not for dengue and chick, no. So as you know, there are eight uh, uh, agents, microbiology agents, on the fever panel. We have discussed malaria, dengue, chikungunya. Let's, uh, let's go to salmonella typhi. Uh, how is it as a sensitivity? So um, meaning uh, the profiles actually, in fact, for tropical diseases, though these are all, uh, you know, fever panel, sometimes for enteric fever, the profile of uh, the clinical profile is a little different. Um, uh, in a strongly suspected patients, we do get a sensitivity of somewhere around 80-85%. Um, and uh, yet I would say that that's probably not the primary diagnostic modality uh, if you're only suspecting enteric fever. So obviously you will be doing your uh, culture. Blood cultures. Yeah. Blood cultures. Yeah. Uh, we, in our... Uh, assemblies, we usually take an oath not to do the Vidal. Yes. Would you would you agree with that? Um, yes. If most people misinterpret the Vidal, Good. that is the concern. Most people misinterpret the Vidal. In a um, in a city like Bombay, where uh, um, you know enteric fever is in fact endemic. And so many other infections are also. Vidal more often than not would give you a, a falsely elevated result. Anything that is more than 320 plus would be significant in our setting with a clinical presentation which is similar to enteric fever. So don't take just the Vidal test results if you are forced to do any time. If blood culture is not available, let's say, then in that situation, if you want to do, uh, I have combined actually two tests together because some of my um, physicians still feel Vidal has a significance, so I have not yet thrown it into the dustbin. I have combined it uh, with uh, um, IgM O for Salmonella, um, knowing that IgM O for Salmonella is only for Salmonella typhi, not for Paratyphi A, which is 30% of the disease burden when it comes to enteric fever. So uh, ideally, don't do sal uh, don't do Vidal in the first week. Uh, of presentation, but more, most often these patients would actually present post the first week of presentation and would have had taken some or the other antimicrobial agents where your blood cultures get, get seriously compromised. In that situation, maybe you could, uh, you could do it and uh, you could, you need to interpret it correctly, you know, don't interpret things like 1 in 40, 1 in 80, 1 in 160 and all. When she said uh, OIGM, Salmonella OIGM, you meant the typhi dot. Yes. What we call the typhi yes. dot. Yes. So you would combine typhi dot with Vidal. We if have we have done that. And uh, 
you find ifi dot I mean that is another oath that we take so that's why there is some rectification so so the, uh, the issue there again is you know in in india there are so many kits that are there the sensitivity can be somewhere around 20% to 60%. So already we, we don't want anyone to do antibody diagnosis for enteric fever, frankly mm -hmm. speaking. We would want you to actually do blood cultures, get the organism, get the drug susceptibility, because today's day, it is very important to know what the susceptibility of these organisms are. It's changing quite rapidly. Fluoroquinolones don't work now. But if you are in a, in a situation where the patient is presented to you, let's say 10 days and 14 days already taken antimicrobial agents and you, you are still you know, trying to find out what's going on, then possibly you need to take the clinical picture and these test results into uh, consideration. consideration together. In typhoid, as you said, some people are already having taken antibiotics, they're skewed. So uh, does PCR help in antibiotic so PCR will not be affected by any antimicro antimicrobial agents because it's ultimately picking up even dead or live, whatever. Mm. So that could be one place where you could use, but I won't be surprised if it is coming negative also. Oh. Because you may not have those bugs, you know, actively multiplying in the, in the bloodstream at that point in time. So as she said, the sensitivity of PCR in picking up uh, enteric fever is not as great as the sensitivity in dengue or malaria or chikungunya. Is that right? Is that yes. the right yes. statement? Okay. Uh, we go to leptospirosis. Uh, what is the role of PCR in leptospirosis? So again, it's probably the first five days um, where you would want to find out. Uh, IgM comes after that. So uh, I think as a part of the fever panel, probably you would be able to pick it up as uh, uh, lepto. And in some situations where the patient presents as a critical patient, which is not, of course, this OPD setting that we are really talking about. So um, this season, we've not picked up any lepto. Oh, this is... We haven't picked okay. up any lepto. In the suburbs, in Cooper, for example, lepto is not uncommon. Okay. Uh, Leptospirosis for us is a difficult diagnosis always because patients come sometimes with a very low grade fever, mild uh, symptoms and uh, suppose they give history of having weighed it through water, etc. Then, then maybe in the first few days a lepto PCR because early diagnosis of leptospirosis might help the patient. Not that the antibiotics are 100% effective but still you may uh, prevent the progression to the more serious wheels disease if detected early. So maybe lepto PCR is a, because we know lepto IgM uh, is difficult in the first few days. Uh, so we have done five, dengue, malaria, chikungunya, lepto, enteric. The sixth is uh, scrub typhus. Rickett CA, yes. Rickett CA. So uh, Rickett CA, our knowledge of Rickett CA is poor. How many of us have seen scrub typhus in the last one year? One case, one person, only one person. So this is our, our, obviously this means that we have missed. So now tell us how not to miss. Okay, so uh, uh, meaning that, that history of some exposure to uh, let's say a forest area or something like that, you know, to vegetations uh, would be important. And uh, these people typically present with fever. Of course, there are other presentations as well, which could be part and parcel of a, a progression of disease. What happens is it is dramatically, uh, you know, they dramatically respond to drugs Doxy like uh, doxycycline. Yeah. And uh, uh, therefore, they'll, get, they'll be meaning treated. And they would not, you know, then be amenable to really identifying as laboratory diagnosis. But this particular PCR has rickettsia in it. And um, we, we have on an occasion picked up rickettsia in a patient who's presented to us with things or uh, with the presentation of like a PUO where, you know, other things have all come, turned out to be negative and then this PCR is positive. So any prolonged pyrexia, of course, ask about moving in forests where ticks might be there. And sometimes the rash is typical, the, you can get a rash. But uh, asking for a uh, PCR, a fever panel, might give you a very easy diagnosis to treat because doxycycline uh, works beautifully in, uh, in this uh, disease. Sorry. Doxycycline, somebody will help me. Anuj, P PCR for how many days? You can do it, meaning if you are suspecting, if a patient comes with PO, PO, or you can still do it, whatever with the time duration. Because and as I said, you know, it is picking up basically the, uh, the uh, nucleic days. acid. Okay. 
Dr. Tanu uh, feels that, Dr. Tanu Singhal is here, uh, she feels that first seven days might be a good time to pick up uh, scrub typhus. So we have now done scrub typhus. Uh, one more Zika has been added to the fever panel. You think so Zika while Zika has been added, uh, we are not supposed to be really reporting it because Achha. it's a reportable disease with the, uh, with our mun meaning municipal uh, this. Uh, it's a notifiable disease, and uh, we would normally refer this particular sample to um, uh, to Kasturba Hospital, and then they will do the additional whatever is required Repo as a part of reporting and information. So we have done seven. I think we have missed one. We have done enteric, no. malaria, chikungunya, leptospirosis, dengue, Zika. Is it right? No. No. Oh, Influenza blood doesn't hai. come in this panel. So this fever panel collects blood. I didn't say that before, but obviously fever panel is from blood, PCR from blood. And uh, yeah, I think we'll go to the next uh, panel. The next commonest outpatient panel is the upper respiratory panel. Upper respiratory panel, which shows us five or six viruses probably. Uh, any, anybody? No, which, which virus should we talk about first? Influenza. So influenza A, B or H3N2, H1N1. What is the commonest form of influenza that you've seen? A or B? A. A. Within Definitely A? Definitely A. So within A, there it's all seasonal. You know, you will have, uh, for example, in the early part of this year, we had um, H3N2. Then at some point in time, now we have H1N1 also coming up. So it's all seasonal. And possibly that is one reason why uh, there are now multiplex PCRs which don't differentiate between one or the other because ultimately the therapy, if you want to give therapy, is the same. then it's the same. So uh, you'll just have influenza A or influenza B. So uh, what has happened is these PCRs panels, they have influenza A, B, then they have H3N2, H1N1, and then they have RSV, and then they have, uh, some have... SARS-CoV-2, SARS uh, but I want only influenza. You can ask for I only can influenza, on, I can yes. and it will be cheaper. So, uh, yes, because it will be a single. So some, some laboratories will do, so for such, uh, you know, individual requests, we will do a real-time PCR. Mm -hmm. uh, but if there is a, a combined, uh, you know, four, influenza A, influenza B, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, RSV, RSV yeah. then we can always do the express flu, which is gene expert. That gives you results about one and a half hours. Okay. And so you get quick results. All of us are not familiar with what to write in the prescription. What do we write? For a respiratory panel, if I want the whole thing, should I write biofire upper respiratory panel? If you want the whole thing, I think that's one thing that is available where you will get results in probably less than two hours. Um, some people also do a real-time PCR which is on open platform. There you will get the results in let's say six to eight hours. We, uh, we utilize the biofire usually because that's available with us and we do it 24 by 7. So uh, I prefer my physician's writing uh, so respiratory the biofire if required. So respiratory biofire is a 5,500 rupee average test and uh, that will give us all the viruses. Some have SARS-CoV-2, some don't. Biofire probably will be a little bit more expensive. It will not be 5,500. Oh. The fourplex PCR could be probably somewhere around 5,000 to let's say around 8,000. But biofires will be anywhere probably around 11,000 plus. So that, so that is the pneumonia panel? No. No. The, the pneumonia panel is a lower respiratory panel. Uh, oh. so this this biofire is, is upper this respiratory? This is upper respiratory biofire. I'm sorry. So... Uh, uh, we will need some more lights in the audience. I don't know why. Are you putting it? Tanvi, are we putting off lights? Because I need to see the audience, if it is possible. Because we'll have some questions and answers soon. Okay. So the respiratory biofire, when we ask for upper respiratory bio panel, so you are saying upper respiratory can be 5,000 and also and 12,000 also. Yes, the 5,000 probably one will give you, um, uh, it's not Biofire. Biofire no. is the trade name, name of that correct. particular company kit that is available. So um, uh, the Express Flu, which is on Gene Expert, has this four, four uh, uh, panel, four target panel, which has RSV, SARS-CoV-2, Flu A and Flu B. 
Okay. So that can be used. We are using that also a lot, uh, which will give you results again in about one and a half hours time. And it is from swabs, nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal swabs. Uh, that's the specimen to be put into a viral transport medium, just like how we used to do for SARS-CoV-2. Um, so that uh, testing takes about, so it gives you four targets. It takes about one and a half hours. And um, the cost would be somewhere around 5,000 to 8,000, depending upon the setting. There is another similar test that we do on an open PCR. So on an open PCR, we can still give you these four targets, but the time will be naturally more, and probably the costing would be about a thousand less. or two less than that. So open PCRs or whatever the technology involves, we don't need to go into that, are cheaper but take more time than the closed PCRs. I think it is important to understand uh, what does your laboratory in within your vicinity, wherever you are sending, what technology they have, what method they are adopting. So if they are adopting an open PCR based method, then you know, you have to accordingly be prepared that your results will come only probably after four or six hours. Whereas if they have something like a gene expert and you don't, the patient doesn't mind paying for that and you want a result early, then uh, you could ask for a gene expert um, if the laboratory has it. So it's up to, up to the clinician, but both these modalities are now available to us. For us, influenza, for example, upper respiratory panel, what therapeutic maneuvers do we have? We don't have anything for COVID. We don't have anything for RSV in, in, in a specific therapy, but we do have oseltamivir for influenza. And therefore, we need to know influenza. And we do know that uh, we need to give oseltamivir within 48 hours to high-risk category patients. Yes. We don't give oseltamivir to everybody, but 48 hours may we have to start. And hence the turnaround time and hence the need to do the test as early as possible becomes important. So as she said, there is a test available which is only influenza without categorizing it into H3N2 or H1N1. It doesn't matter for us whether it's H3N2 or H1N1 because we can treat it treat either with oseltamivir. So we may be able to ask for such a test uh, and get the result on the phone at least within four to six hours if possible and start. And what I do is I start oseltamivir and if I don't get the positive test, I will omit the oseltamivir. That is what I can do. Uh, so respiratory panel, uh, now, before we go to the th third panel, we'll open the uh, uh, audience questions for some time. Yeah, Tushar? Uh, can you give a mic there in the audience? Correct, yeah. Yes. Very important because there are other viruses, so many other viruses. Yes. Within corona, there are so many viruses yes. that you should not be. Okay. Uh, anybody else wants to? We are. We have covered two panels. One is a fever panel through blood test. One is the upper respiratory tract panel. Anybody wants to ask questions? Please raise their hands. Please stand up, and if you can, just talk loudly. I will take that question first. Yeah, your question. If you can talk loudly, I will give the mic. Huh. I'll repeat the question for the camera actually. Yeah. Can we have some more light in the audience, please? Yeah. yeah. Good morning, uh, sir and ma'am. Actually, my question is regarding the biofire because there are a lot of patients that do it, and especially pediatric patients. Uh, a lot of my patients do it at Breach Candy itself. And because I practice homeopathy, uh, as far as our like therapy is concerned, it's not dependent on the result. So I just wanted your advice clinically, when should I be advising the biofire because there's a cost factor involved. Clinically, like when do we decide? I think you, <laughs> see both the tests are available. As Sir said, you know, biofire gives you a whole lot of other viruses yes. that might also be responsible for upper respiratory tract infections. If you are, um, if you feel that it's very important to know other than, you know, if these four, if these four were not there and something else is there and you really want to know what it is, maybe you could adopt the uh, biofire. Another important thing with biofire is that it also has atypical bugs. So uh, we had an outbreak of uh, uh, border pa teller paraportuses portuses this Jan, early Jan, Jan to April actually. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, that nothing else will pick up. So um, uh, uh, what else is there? There is mycoplasma in that uh, panel as well. 
So atypical ones, if they are there, adenovirus, we had an outbreak, uh, again, yes. this Jan to uh, April. Um, so there are plenty of other viruses which can cause uh, uh, upper respiratory uh, syndromes. And uh, you'd have to therefore decide, and of course, based upon how much the patient can pay. If you are only looking at intervention and therapy based, then probably your four panel PCR is enough. But um, if you want to find out exactly what is happening, then maybe you can uh, do the do the biofire. Yeah, Dr. Maria. If I want more than four basic ones that we have already discussed, and biofire is too expensive, which somewhere around 11 to 13,000, depending upon where you ask. There is an in-between solution kind of a thing that we use. We use certain other labs which have a PCR panel, which have adeno, because as a pediatrician, we are looking for adenos because they have been creating a lot of havoc compared to the adults. They have been nicer to adults than to pediatrics. Yes. So can you please elaborate on those? So those are all open PCRs. So when we are talking about express flu and we are talking about respiratory biofires, these are closed PCRs. They have a certain number of targets and they can only pick those up. Um, now, if you have to mix and match and try and say, okay, I want this part also in my PCR panel, then uh, we'll have to, in the lab, add that particular PCR on an open platform. So we can do that today with molecular methods, you know, being really uh, uh, progressed and plenty of kits being available, good kits, that too. Uh, we could add uh, a list of uh, targets that our clinical team wants. Of course, you'll have to give us some time on that, but then we can add it. It can okay. be done. Ma'am, we had a question, Dr. Mitha. Uh, I did not say that, ma'am. So basically what I said is that gene expert, of course, sensitivity wise, probably gene expert also will be good because it's a closed system PCR. It's a, it's a walk away. No, we don't uh, do much of manual processing. So when, the moment you do manual, a lot of manual processing, there could be, uh, uh, you know, reasons for errors and false negatives, false positives. But with, with these closed systems, we avoid all of that because all that the technical staff does is they take a certain volume of the specimen, put it into the cartridge and it's gone into the machine. Everything else happens in the machine. So uh, uh, it's better in terms of probably sensitivity. It's better in terms of uh, the turnaround time. If how you, much time? Which, I mentioned about one and a half hours. The actual turnaround time is somewhere around 45 to 50 minutes. But for us, once the sample comes in the lab, we have certain pre-analytical steps to follow. So at least around one and a half hours you should give us. And if you fast, meaning you could always tell the lab that this is an urgent result that we want. Uh, we have methods of fast tracking also um, through the uh, information system. What's we, the cost? I um, it can be anywhere between, uh, let's say, around 5,000 to 8,000. Thank you. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, Mike, what are you doing? I'm sorry, in my lab, I am not doing malaria. It's hematology which is doing malaria. But um, your lab will validate that whatever kit they adopt, they should validate it for sensitivity specificity with, with their previous kit or with controls. They should do that. That's part and parcel of the exercise whenever we adopt a new test. I'm talking about keeping the kit in the clinic. She's asking about what You're malaria talking about kit, point of care, point of RDTs. care should they give. You said there are many RDTs. varieties. Yes, yes. I won't be able to, you know, comment on that. I'm sorry. Yeah. So when we are talking about biofire, so in that, is there any specific virus or any any organism which has a specific treatment that we ask a patient to go in for a biofire and spend 11,000? I mean, or you just treat somebody so as a simple viral infection, so they need not go for such an expensive test. I mean, if it is just a simple antiviral treatment, like how we give them. That is exactly why it is your choice, ma'am. Yeah, which is what I want so to understand. If you, so is there any organism so there? So your flus are there, your huh. flus are there, and your atypical organisms are there, which might require specific treatment. Okay, so now, if, your, uh, clinic, if the clinical presentation is such that you are thinking about these, remember in the first part only I said that it's all about history taking examination, having a list of differential diagnoses, and then asking for the investigation. So can you just so, tell us any of these? 
these organisms which are covered in biofire? I can, I can tell you. Yeah. Influenza is treatable yeah. with pertussis. Yeah. Dr. Moniar will tell us pertussis and paraportusis are antibiotic, uh, uh, requiring antibiotic. Mycoplasma, chlamydia, they are all antibiotic uh, requiring organisms. So there are specific treatments based on the PCR that you can start. And these are not culture driven also yes. in the sense that you don't need antibiotic sensitivity for chlamydia, pertussis, etc. There are specific treatments. There are specific treatments. Okay. 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 Yeah. Are you look, be able to just give the mic there? Sir, I thought you were taking the question. You wanted to ask a question? You can ask the question, you have the mic. Yeah. Just wanted to ask, at the end of the month, you have any evaluation system that this month, dengue was more or you know, uh, uh, typhoid was more, more. And is there any way we can come to know? Yes, certainly. Meaning for us, we, uh, we prepare that, uh, you know, meaning epidemiology sheet uh, every month. And we actually presented to our uh, HIC. We give all this data to uh, BMC also. Ideally, it should be BMC who will be rolling it out. But if our clinicians specifically ask us, then we inform them also. So may I make a we request? Have that data. May I make a request here for us that Canbridge Kennedy Hospital give their data on WhatsApp to one of us? If it is which not is a very privacy, probably specific to South Mumbai. Which is fine. Okay. Many of us are. How many of you are from South Mumbai? Raise your many. <laughs> so just, if you can, if you can, and then all these people are on our... No, we know now it's H1N1, it had come in the newspapers. Okay, <laughs> okay. so yeah, we, we'll try. Suburban gives us, as you know, uh, NM... It's not difficult for a lab to do that. Metropolis gives us, NM gives us. So we can ask hospitals like uh, Kokeleben, where Dr. Uh, Tanu goes, to give us some data so that we are aware and therefore more uh, guarded. Okay. The, so uh, we are called two panels. Sorry, Madam. Uh, just oh. last question, uh, Madam. You, you know, fewer profile or fewer panel. You mentioned something about the Zika. Do you see such cases in I the city of Mumbai? I have not seen Zika. No. No, we are not seeing Zika. So only theoretical. Not yet. So far. No, th theoretical. Maybe <laughs> the BMC has uh, identified Zika. Zika, but you know, we have not seen. Clinically, not probably yeah. relevant yet. Question. We'll yes. we will stop here. We'll stop here for the moment. I think there's one question. Epstein Bar, Epstein -Bar is, is a different PCR and a different set of tests that could be asked for. Most people ask for uh, viral capsid antigen IgM, uh, which um, is one of the early markers for a reactivation. Because uh, Epstein Bar, what we would normally get would uh, with you know whatever uh, would be uh, usually a reactivation disease. And in certain set of patients, which is probably not related to the pediat, uh, meaning the oh, the um, uh, the community settings, uh, uh, in some settings we do even a PCR. We will now uh, go to the third panel. There is a lower respiratory tract panel, which is called the pneumonia panel, uh, which requires either the sputum or a bronchoalveolar lavage, for example, and. This is usually an indoor panel, meaning in hospital, admitted patients ka panel. Very unusual for it to be uh, 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 an OPD panel. O also, we should realize that any outpatient pneumonia or a community acquired pneumonia that we see in the OPD, we are allowed to start antibiotics empirically. And we'll be talking about that with Dr. Tanu Singhal. So that panel, I don't think we may need to familiarize oursel ourselves very closely with. The other panel that we might want to know about is if uh, the GI panel, if there is any relevance to the outpatient. I'll just introduce the problem. Many of our patients are admitted. Uh, as she said, even one dose of antibiotic can cause Clostridium difficile infection. And Clostridium difficile infections often manifest after discharge, meaning within two to six weeks of discharge, the patient will come to you with diarrhea, low-grade fever, abdominal pain. Any hospital discharged patient who comes to us with diarrhea, abdominal pain, and fever, we have to think of Clostridium difficile. What investigation, if we do think of it, should we ask for? So with, if you're specifically thinking about CDI, then you have a single plex PCR that is available, uh, and you have a multiplex PCR that is available. The single plex meaning just it will pick up only CDI. 
So um, uh, that test is again on the gene expert. Most of us use the gene expert. There may be some labs who are using open PCRs, but as far as I know, most of us use the gene expert because it, gene expert machine is very free, meaning easily available uh, because most of us do our TB testing on that. Gene expert again is a brand name. Is a brand name, yes. And uh, um, so uh, you could, if you're strongly thinking of that, then you could ask for a multiple, uh, single plex PCR, a single target PCR, which is only for CDI. It's easily available. You get results again in about maybe one and a half hours. There's no pre-processing, etc. cetera. Um, if you are not sure, then maybe you know you could ask for a multiplex PCR where you have you get uh, Salmonella, you get Shigella, you get Campylobacter, you get a lot of um, viruses which also cause uh, GI infections, and uh, you get also parasites um, which may cause GI infections. You so get Nora virus, for them. example. No, you get GRDIasis, you get amoebiasis. Uh, I think. Uh, yes, it is there. And amoeba histolytica is there. So. Uh, and we have to give what sample for this? Stool sample. And it should be an unformed stool specimen. We do not accept, or rather it is a rejection criteria uh, to get to uh, for uh, GI-PCR or any kind of, uh, even CDI-PCR, we reject all formed specimens. So it liquid, has to be unformed liquid and stool liquid stool. should be given as a sample for PCR. We have been also asking for uh, C. difficile toxins. Is that something that we need not ask? So you could, you could, so that's also one more modality that is available, but uh, you know, the sensitivity of um, your um, uh, toxin based assays can be anywhere between 60 to 80 percent. Um, the PCR is more, uh, more sensitive and uh, it gives you faster results. Uh, some people or some labs can uh, do a two-step method of doing a GDH analysis, which is also done in the US. GDH and GDH, if positive only, then they go ahead to do the toxin analysis. Um, that could also be a strategy to adopt, but uh, the sensitivity of a PCR is definitely better. And why we often do that in in-house is also from the infection prevention point of view. For us, it's very important that we identify these cases um, correctly. GDH is glutamate dehydrogenase. It's an enzyme that is produced by a whole lot of bacteria, including um, uh, Clostridium difficile. So uh, you could pick up, if your GDH is positive, then it could be some uh, gram negatives uh, or uh, Clostridium difficile, and then you do a specific Clostridium difficile toxin testing. Cost of that the PCR? That also should be, uh, the PCR would be anywhere um, more than 4,000, 4,000 to maybe 6,000. The, uh, the toxin-based assays would be probably less than uh, 2,000, 1,500 so, to 2,000. So again, this PCR is important because there is therapy. Once you diagnose, what happens typically is a patient comes to you with diarrhea and abdominal pain and maybe fever and WBC count is often high in these patients you are going to give antibiotics. You are going to give whatever you give. And that will be a mistake because obviously Clostridium difficile will thrive in the presence of antibiotics even more probably. And therefore, if you can diagnose C. difficile, therefore you will be then giving specific, either metronidazole or the better an uh, antibiotic might be vancomycin. We will be giving specific antibiotic therapy for C. C difficile rather than keep on trying flagyl and that in, this, in such patients. So yeah. That's how this diagnostic stewardship will help antibiotic stewardship and not make us make mistakes. Do you think, sir, um, I'm sorry, I'm reversing the <laughs> role. <laughs> For Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, it might also be useful. So I, I believe what we do, non-typhoidal Salmonella probably still respond to some antibiotics which typhoidal Salmonella does not respond. So maybe that. Campylobacter does not respond to chlorofluoroquinolones mm. now, and it requires azithromycin, for example. So I think it would be, and I don't know whether traveler's diarrhea would be an important area yes, for this. Yes, it's part and parcel of uh, the E. coli that we have there. So traveler's di diarrhea probably have more Campylobacter, mo more Shigella, etc. Uh, no, Shigella mm. is very common in Mumbai. Mumbai, anyway. Very, yeah. very common in yeah. Mumbai. Yeah. What is the cost of GFI? Will, will it, any, uh, see, Biofire. these are multiplex targets close to around, you know, 20, 25 targets, 20, 25 different organisms coming in one panel with one sample. It will be always more than 10,000. 
always more than that. Okay. And we don't dispatch, actually, my lab's practice is we don't dispatch any biofire results without, meaning the GIPCR results without doing a stool routine, whether asked or not. We always do it for ourselves at least, you know, to kind of correlate. And if um, uh, occasionally, if, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we also get uh, um, uh, these... Uh, uh, opportunistic parasites like uh, cyclospora, cryptosporidium, there we also do the 1% ZN. Uh, it may not be important from community point of view, but occasionally we've had uh, um, uh, even community patients having cryptosporidium particularly because it's resistant to the routine disinfectant that we use in the, in the swimming pool. So we've had that kind of a situation occasionally. So GIPCR. it's not a prognostic. So it's n it's not a prognostic test. It's a di diagnostic test. When your patient presents with unformed stool, meaning at presentation, you should ideally do it. Don't do it. You know, um, any patient with chronic diarrhea, diarrhea should be there. So that should be your criteria to probably <coughs> select uh, a GI PCR. Uh, we have overshot the time, but I will just ask one very quick because that Dr. Tanu Singhal also is going to uh, overlap in that area. Uh, when a patient comes to them with uh, fever, cough, X-ray shadows, and they want to diagnose tuberculosis, and uh, they will send sputum for gene expert, which uh, is traditionally done, uh, should they send or do they just refer to the patient to the TB? So uh, sputum for gene expert is something which is very easily available. I think if you're suspecting tuberculosis, don't only send for sputum for gene expert, also ask for a culture. Yeah. It's very easily, you'll get results quickly and then you can certainly refer to, uh, uh, to the appropriate uh, specialty. But uh, that's a test that anyone can, you know, if you suspect, go ahead doing it. So uh, gene expert, as we know, we are familiar with gene expert, what it tells us two things. So the, the current gene experts tell us whether or not mycobacterium tuberculosis complex is present or not. And if it is present, then it also um, uh, gives us indications about uh, rifampicin is susceptible or not susceptible. So uh, that information, this two information is, uh, is available. And uh, there are other gene expert platforms where, you know, additional information would be available, but that's not really for uh, community practice. So um, uh, a, gene, a, a normal gene expert ultra or a simple gene expert should be okay. And should we be sending that traditional sputum for AFB three-day samples? So, um, it can be two samples also. Whatever one has to be a morning specimen and one has to be a spot specimen. So, three specimens may not be needed. What we do uh, when we have such requests is we pull up both the specimens and then process for AFB culture. For AFP culture, we pull up those. Uh, otherwise, with one specimen, only a gene expert needs to be done. We could go ahead with it. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, I think if the patient in, uh, is enrolled into uh, that, uh, this, then yes. You can we, induce sputum. We will be discussing that. Uh, so now, uh, I think we have discussed a lot. I am sure there are more questions. But for us clinicians, uh, these two areas, fever panel, upper respiratory tract panel, probably and uh, to a smaller extent, GI panel would become very important. Uh, and uh, if you, there are any questions, because we'll be opening our chat, if there are any specific questions which we have not been able to answer, I would request you to put those questions on the chat later today. And if she has time and uh, if we can get her to answer those questions, we will do that. So I think a uh, big hand to... Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Pujari. Uh, Thank you so much. I, I hope uh, it was not a waste of a Sunday morning for you. <laughs> Uh, we have a small uh, moment for you. That's Dr. Rachita. Thank you very much. Now it gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Tanu Singhal on stage, please. Tanu ji, idhar se aaji. Uh, 
Dr. Tushar Maniar, please uh, join us on stage. She's a pediatrician. He, she needs a pediatrician there. She's a she's an infectious disease specialist, so it's partly she needs me also. We will uh, get, have one of the chairs. So Dr. Tanu Singhal has accompanied us uh, to Jamnabai school for a solo session some months back. And we had a wonderful four hour session with her on uh, infectious diseases in general, uh, with where we uh, covered monsoon fever most. That session is on YouTube. So if you wish to see, it's called Solo uh, with Dr. Tanu Singhal. And uh, uh, please go through that uh, session. Today, uh, we had promised her that we will be doing predominantly non-monsoon illness questions so that you know you don't get thoroughly bored uh, so uh, we have prepared and we have also told, told her that we have a set of 30 questions and they'll be a rapid fire meaning no major discussions no fear no questions from the audience just nuggets of absolutely important investig uh, uh, information so this this uh, questions these questions will be asked by dr tushar maniar and i will butt in only if necessary Dr. Singhal, uh, welcome. And uh, a, a couple of personal questions to you. Yes. So uh, normally, if there is no academics, what do you do on a Sunday morning? <laughs> well, there are very few Sundays when there are no academics. But gen generally, I just um, go be around the house, do, do a little bit of cooking. That's it. Do and watch a movie. <laughs> are you an ODT person? And if yes, what is the latest thing that you watched on ODT? Well, um, I think I just saw a little bit of Kalapani. You did? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that is her area. You know, Kalapani is that leptospirosis-like illness. <laughs> and she would be interested in that. And uh, what, what are your kids? Uh, what do they do? Well, I have two children. Uh, my son is 19. He's studying computer science at IIT Bombay. Mm -hmm. And my daughter is in 12th in Jamnabai. And she's pursuing economics. Wonderful. No, no medicine for either of them. And... Uh, yeah, so there are some of us who are quite stupid and have children who are encouraged to do medicine. <laughs> but but mostly people have now graduated to not doing that. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, the, we start with 30 questions. As you uh, know, we have uh, one hour and we have 30 questions. And therefore, brevity will be the soul of uh, messages. So Dr. Tanu, can I start asking you? We'll what uh, is keep the, the mic close to you so that uh, the recording can be captured. What is the drug of choice for acute bacterial tonsillitis for you? Amoxicillin. Dose and duration, please. So the dose is in adults, 500 milligram twice a day for 10 days. And in children, you give 30 to 40 mg per kg of amoxicillin for 10 days. The maximum dose is 1 gram. And the other important thing is that you can give it as a single dose as well. So suppose compliance is an issue, you can give 1 gram once a day. Sure. Thank you. Does recurrent adenoid infection need antibiotics? Yes, actually we are seeing that quite common now that you have children with allergic rhinitis who have adenoids, who have snoring. And some of these children come with fevers which don't get better in three or four days like normal viral fevers. They have headaches, sometimes the discharge is thick and yellow. They may have associated otitis media. So these are the kind of patients who would benefit with antibiotics and normally we would like to use amoxicillin clavulanic acid for this. Great. And the other important thing is for sinusitis in children, you need to give prolonged therapy. It is indeed paradoxical that for pneumonia you can treat for 5 to 7 days, but for sinusitis you need to treat for 10 to 14 days. Absolutely. Normally we always say that antibiotics are not to be used in diarrhea. When would you use an antibiotic? So in bloody diarrhea, that's an absolute indication because that may mean that you're dealing with Shigella, which would benefit from antibiotic therapy. So you would choose either cefexime or azithromycin for this. Excellent. What is your opinion on abuse of imidazole in children and adults? So in children, we normally don't recommend metronidazole, tinidazole, ornidazole at all because studies have shown that children below the age of five years don't get amoebiasis. So the indication 
is and many times you know patients are prescribed O2 that's a very favorite drug now O2 is oflox and onidazole and ofloxacin does not work for shigella in today's day and age so that is why and we don't need the onidazole so that is not a good drug to use so if you in what are the indications for using imidazoles in children one is that if you have bloody diarrhea which is not responding to appropriate drugs for shigella like you've used cefixime or azithromycin then you might want to use metronidazole or the other situation is if you have proven giardiasis that means you've done a stool routine and you have found giardia then you use it if you see cysts of entamoeba histolytica in the stool that is not an indication to use these drugs because cysts can be of the non-pathogenic entamoeba histolytica dispar so many of us prescribe metro if you see cysts of eh that's not indicated but if you see cysts of giardia then you have to give is rifaximin over prescribed actually as a pediatrician i hardly use yes, rifaximin exactly. this was actually the question to be asked by him uh, yeah. but i don't know what is the formulation and i've never used yeah it. so i think it's used um, because it's a kind of a non absorbable antibiotic it uh, dr tushar may know more but i see a lot of adult physicians prescribing it also it's commonly used by the hepatologists etc for gastric decontam intestinal decontamination so there are three or four indications of rifaximin which are appropriate and we'll discuss uh, them in the bingo game but i we do see a lot of rifaximin prescription in empiric therapy of diarrhea and i think that should stop which children need antibiotic prophylaxis after the first episode of uti okay <clears throat> so normally speaking there is a controversial area okay so this is a controversial area in many uh, resource rich countries they have stopped doing this they would treat when a uti happens but our for example indian academy of pediatrics guidelines are clear so um first of all that every child below the age of 5 years will need an antibiotic prophylaxis till you have completed the workup for recurrent uti that means you have at least done an ultrasound kub so if you have done an ultrasound kub this is the first episode of uti you've done an ultrasound kub and it is normal you may not give antibiotic prophylaxis but you may watch this patient and if he gets a repeat infection then do an mcu on the other hand if the ultrasound kub is abnormal you have to do an mcu and if the mcu shows that there is vesico ureteric reflux then you have to give antibiotic prophylaxis which depends on the grade of reflux if the reflux is 3 4 or 5 you have to give it till the age of 5 years and if it is a lower grade reflux grade 1 or 2 then you have to give it for 1 year uh, you can ask that right? there are is, adult questions <laughs> but, yeah. so but you can continue i am now allowed to ask adult questions okay, okay. thank you so you can either use trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or you can use nitrofurantoin you also get plain trimethoprim which you can use which side effects are less and in children like babies who are below 6 months you can actually use cefalexin as well so what is your preferred uti prophylaxis for the elderly i give them either nitrofurantoin or tmp smx and it should not be driven by what susceptibility shown on the urine culture report because many times a urine culture shows that it is non susceptible to tmp smx you can still use it i think um, i find a lot of people get nausea vomiting with nitrofurantoin so that may be a limitation do you do g6pd before tmp smx no go to so no okay. what is the dose you use for either So in children we use one to two mg per kg of the TMP component, and in adults we normally use like half a tablet of Ceftran DS at bedtime, or you get plain trimethoprim also, hundred mg I think Baxtol, Baxtol, which you can use. So yeah, so that uh, this is UTI prophylaxis in the elderly would be for how long? So normally you know you have to give it to these people who have diabetic cystopathy or who have. post void residue so normally we give it for 2 to 3 months because in that time normally you know the uroactive medications are started like uretone urimax and other things and so after a couple of months when you find that the bladder is emptying well then you can actually stop uh, the prophylaxis that is typically what i do and at the same time we have to make sure that constipation is corrected if women are there then they are using an intravaginal estrogen cream all those measures are also important and when everything is sorted out then you can consider stopping the prophylaxis 
What are the injectable antibiotics that a family physician may use in their outpatient practice? So, you know, I can look at it in two ways. One is that you are using an injectable antibiotic up front uh, for a patient coming with an infection who doesn't want to get hospitalized. And the second is you are using it as continuation in a hospitalized patient who has to complete the course of treatment. So in the first situation, like I would think of ceftriaxone. I think that is a antibiotic which you would want to use like in, let's say you have a patient who's, I mean, I really can't, uh, one is a case of a respiratory infection where the patient doesn't want to get hospitalized, but you have to be sure that your patient is not hypoxic or something. And the second place is a urinary tract infection, where you actually find that your um, urine culture is showing a bacteria which is resistant to oral antibiotics. So in that case, you cannot use ceftriaxone because most of the bacteria are resistant and you could have very well given cefixime for the same reason. So then you would use drugs like maybe ertapenem, which is once a day therapy, or you could use aminoglycoside. Of course, in adults, there is a problem because of its ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. You can give Magnex Fort or cefoperazone sulbactam, which is like twice a day dose. And one more instance is enteric fever. Like you have a patient with enteric fever who is basically not accepting well orally or something, then you could initiate therapy with four grams of trixone once daily. Any uh, role for UTI, uh, um, aminoglycoside in children for UTI? And can we give it once a day instead yes. of giving twice a day? Yes. Intramuscular? So we see ESBL UTIs in children. Now we must understand one important thing that you may actually get a pathogen in your urine culture report which is resistant to cephalosporins. But sometimes your patient will get better with cephalosporins. That is because the antibiotic is concentrated in the urine. So if your patient has clinically got better, then you should not change the antibiotic based on the urine culture report. You can con continue that treatment, but you have to watch these patients for a early treatment failure or a relapse, in which case you will have to give appropriate antibiotics. But let us say you have a patient who is uh, having a ESBL UTI who's not responding to the cephalosporins and you have to give an injectable antibiotic, then aminoglycoside once a day is an option. Uh, one important thing that she said, and of course this is going a little fast, I am sure, and therefore you'll have to go home and see the video again. Uh, Enteric fever, she said, and this is a very important message for outpatient people, four grams once a day can be given for a proven, maybe cultural proven, sensitive uh, to ceftriaxone enteric fever. And how many days would you give ceftriaxone? So normally you would give five to six days till there is defervescence and the patient is accepting orally well and then you can switch to cefexime. And remember the dose of cefexime for enteric fever is 1200 milligrams per day. Means three times the dose which you normally would give a patient. Um, 600 twice a day and you have to warn the patient that you have given a higher dose because when this patient will go to the pharmacy, the pharmacist will say, oh, you've been given the wrong dose. And I've had patients coming back to me and saying ki, this. So you have to tell them that I'm giving you a higher dose because that is what is recommended. And the total duration of therapy has to be two weeks because if you give lesser than two weeks, then you have a risk of relapse. Which is different from the azithromycin therapy for enteric, where the duration might be less? Yes, for azithromycin, your dose is 20 milligrams per kg or a maximum dose of one gram per day for a period of seven to 10 days because azithromycin remains in your body for a long time even after you stop taking it. So shorter duration of therapy is possible. Yeah. Going, going further now for tuberculosis, how does one investigate close contacts of a patient with tuberculosis? I think that's a very important thing because now we have started realizing the importance of contact screening and prophylaxis. So it's very important that if you've made a diagnosis of pulmonary TB, because this applies mainly to pulmonary TB and not extra pulmonary TB, because if you have a patient with spine TB and the chest X-ray is normal, he's not going to transmit infection to the family members. So we are talking about any kind of pulmonary TB not just smear positive. Because of course, if a patient is smear positive, the infectivity is very high and the risk of transmission to family members is high. But even if you have a person who has a sputum smear negative pulmonary TB may be diagnosed by gene expert, even that person will transmit infection to his household contacts. 
So the first thing you have to do is you have to evaluate the household contacts for active disease. Like you ask them, are you having fever? Are you having cough? Are you having night sweats, weight loss? Because what you don't want to do is to give chemoprophylaxis to a patient who has actual disease. So you do a symptom screen. Then if necessary, you can even do a chest x-ray. Because sometimes you may have uh, patients who may not be coming out with the symptoms. They may be vague. Then you may have to do a chest x-ray. So once you have, by this methodology, excluded active disease, then you have to decide whether these people are candidates for chemoprophylaxis. And there is an important change in recommendations now. Because earlier what was happening is that chemoprophylaxis was mainly given to children below the age of five years. Because we know that if these children get TB, they have rapid, they have an infection, they can progress to TB, they can get TB meningitis. So the recommendations say that if you have a child less than five years, you don't need to do any more tests. You just give them INH 10 mg per kg per day for six months. But if you have a patient above the age of five years, which is either an adolescent or an adult, then you have two options. One option is to just proceed with chemoprophylaxis. And the other option is to actually do a test to pick up latent TB. And that test can either be a MANTU test with two TU, or it can be an IGRA, which we know uh, as uh, interferon gamma release assays. And if those tests are positive, then you give them chemoprophylaxis. So that is a little bit of a difference between whether the contact is below five years or above five years. Can you explain why it is important to not miss out an active case and give them chemoprophylaxis? Because then you will be giving single therapy for a disease which will actually amplify resistance. So that is why you should be very sure. And sometimes if you are not sure at that time, you could keep these patients under surveillance for two to four weeks before you decide whether you want to, you know, kind of treat them for disease or you want to treat them for chemoprophylaxis. Is there a difference if the primary case is an MDR-TB and then the management of uh, latent tuberculosis? So that is a good point. So this applies, whatever I said, is basically ap applicable to if the patient has sensitive TB. Now we are seeing a lot of MDR-TB cases in Mumbai. And if your uh, person is MDR, then you can give chemoprophylaxis in only two or three circumstances. One is that the patient has rifampicin sensitive resistant disease but is INH sensitive. Then in that case you will give INH after you rule out active disease. The other possibility is that your patient is MDR resistant to INH and rifampicin but is sensitive to fluoroquinolones. Then you can give levofloxacin to the contact for six months. But if your primary case is resistant to INH, resistant to rifampicin and resistant to levofloxacin, then you do not have any option for chemoprophylaxis in these patients. You can't use drugs like linezolid for chemoprophylaxis, etc. These, in this case, what you have to advise is that you should try and separate the MDR cases. Like, you know, normally we say that if the person in the house has TB, there's no issue. Everybody can mingle, stay. Of course, you have to follow simple precautions like keep the doors and windows open. And you have to try and see that the person who has TB sleeps in a separate room. Of course, that is often not possible in Mumbai. But, but when you have a family member who has MDR, then you have to try and make at least some attempts for isolation of that person, at least for the first one or two months till that person becomes non-contagious. And would wearing a mask or anything like that is advisable for the patient? Yes. So for the patient, yes, you would have to ask them to try and keep wearing a mask. And now people have got used to masks after COVID pandemic. You know, there's so many people wearing masks that compliance to masking has generally become better. So what is... Only surgical mask. You don't have to ask the patient to wear an N95 mask. That will be very suffocating for the patient. Yes. For MDR. But for drug-sensitive TB, two to three weeks is enough. So, if you, so that is why if you have a patient with tuberculosis, you can ask them to go back to school, college, or office after two to three weeks of treatment, provided they have now become asymptomatic, etc. If a patient is assuming that the suspected TB patient is producing sputum, which unfortunately for 
us pediatricians difficult, what test would you order on a sputum? So very important, you know that uh, you have to make sure that they're actually bringing out sputum because most of them actually bring out saliva. And then to send that test is a waste of resources. So you have to make sure, visually inspect that it is indeed sputum and the quality is good. Now let us say the sputum quality is not good or it is saliva, etc. Then you have two options and that is also applicable to adults. Huh? Like we talk about in children, but even your adolescents and little older adults, you can do a gastric lavage because that is the simplest thing to do uh, where you ask the patient to come fasting in the morning at 8.30 and then uh, you just put a orogastric tube in the stomach and you aspirate neat first. So you don't put anything inside, you just aspirate neat and if you get about 5 to 10 ml of uh, you know, mucusy material, that is enough. But if you don't get anything, then you flush with 10 ml of normal saline and then re-aspirate and see. Uh, twice you can do it and you also have to change the position of the patient from supine to left lateral and right lateral when you're collecting the specimen. So that is one thing which you can do and the, has to be transported to the lab immediately. Another option which somebody was mentioning earlier was induced sputum. So if the patient is not bringing out sputum, then you can first give them a bronchodilator nebulization with salbutamol and then give hypertonic saline, not normal saline, hypertonic saline because it is an irritant to the airways and it causes the person to cough and then that material can be collected. But remember that if you are doing an induced sputum collection, you have to make sure that you're wearing your N95 mask and the room is when ventilated with an exhaust, etc. Otherwise, you might catch TB in that process. And in induced sputum, if the patient is not spontaneously able to cough out, even then after chest physiotherapy, you can do a nasopharyngeal aspirate to collect the material. So these are two things which you can do. Which test should be ordered on sputum? So Dr. Uh, Aruna talked about that, but you have to basically do a AFB smear, you have to do a gene expert, and you have to do a midget culture. Why it is important to order a culture also? Because the sensitivity of the gene expert is lower than that of the culture. And you have to really, and your, um, you know, your, uh, your molecular test cannot give you the susceptibility to all the drugs. So that is why doing a midget culture is also important. What about LPA or other tests from the sputum? Yeah, so that is, so what happens is that you have two situations. One is your sputum is smear positive or the sputum is smear negative. If your sputum is smear positive, you are going to do a gene expert which will tell you that rifampicin is, what is the status of rifampicin sensitivity. But you will not know what is the status of INH sensitivity or sensitivity of various other second line drugs like fluoroquinolones. So you have these LPA tests, the line probe assay 1 and line probe assay 2. Line probe assay 1 will tell you what is the sensitivity to both INH and rifampicin. And INH sensitivity further, it will tell you whether it is what type of mutation it is so you can decide what kind of drug you want to give, which is a little complicated and we won't discuss here. And you have a second line LPA, which will tell you what is the susceptibility to fluoroquinolones, to aminoglycosides, etc. So the second line LPA you order only if your expert tells you that it is rifampicin resistant disease or it is INH resistant disease. Otherwise, you just do a first line LPA because please remember, there is also a change in our government's policies for treatment of INH resistant TB. Because earlier what we were saying is that our regime of two HRZE, four HRE is good enough for whatever kind of TB you have, whether it is INH sensitive or resistant. But now we have realized that if you have INH resistant TB and you treat them with this regime, then you have a higher chance of relapse. So you have to make a special effort to pick up INH resistance. And if your isolate is INH resistant, rifampicin sensitive, then you have to give six months treatment with rifampicin, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, and levofloxacin. If there was no sputum produced, what test can we order to confirm, to get an organism or a tissue? Specific? In a pulmonary TB, X-ray shadows, symptoms, fever, weight loss, night sweats, and X-ray shadows are there, and you cannot get sputum. No, then you can... In children, we do gastric lavage and induced sputum, and in adults, you can do a bronchoscopic lavage. But see, I think the question here is, would you go to those lengths, you know, to try and confirm the diagnosis? 
I think we should do it in Mumbai because Mumbai is a hot spot for MDR TB. And if you miss the diagnosis of MDR, you are delaying effective treatment by one or two months. And also because presence of fever, cough, and um, X-ray shadows can be due to some other disease. But yes, remember that in all cases of pulmonary TB, you will be able to confirm the microbiologic diagnosis only in 50%. Even if you do everything by the book, you do gastric lavage, you do induced sputum, you do bronchoscopic lavage. So that doesn't mean that if all these tests are negative, you will leave the patient like that. Yes, then there is a role of starting patient on TB treatment. And another test where you can do in that situation is a CT scan. You know, because sometimes you may get a uh, you get a little more handle of what is happening with a CT. Active, activity wise. And also, if you're seeing necrotic mediastinal nodes and other things, you are more sure that you're dealing with TB. So when you said 50% may not show any microbiology, how many times in the last, say, three months have you given TB medicine without having a microbiologic diagnosis? Again, I would say, um, let's say, 40% yes because yes. we have see sometimes you know you have those you've done gastric lavage it's negative you have these necrotic nodes but not every patient will consent to an e-bus or a CT guided biopsy of those nodes so then you have to offer empiric therapy mm -hmm. of course something else which I have really found useful in some of these patients is to do a neck screening with an ultrasound and you sometimes pick up supraclavicular nodes which are easily biopsiable so when I'm a patient with suspected pulmonary TB I uh, order for a CT chest I also ask them to include the lower part of the neck because you pick up these supraclavicular nodes which are easily amenable to biopsy and the yield from the biopsy may be higher than your gastric lavage or your bronchoscopy also is FNSC now an archaic test for lymph nodes? Um, it helps if your node is necrotic because you do an ultrasound and if you find that there is necrosis in the middle of the node, then I would first do an FNA because you will get liquid material where your chances of picking up the expert is high. On the other hand, if your node is solid, then the FNA yield is likely to be poor and in that case, it is better to do a core biopsy. However, if you have a node and you have done an FNA and in the FNA you are not seeing the caseating granulomas and your gene expert is negative, then it is always better to do a core biopsy or an excision biopsy to confirm the diagnosis because sometimes what you think is TB may be actually something else. It may be a lymphoma or something else. So, Which fever should be reported to MCGM in Mumbai? Again, I'm... I think there's a whole list, you know, TB is the most important, TB is a reportable disease and actually there's a gazette notification which says that you can go to jail if you don't report. So <laughs> that is there. But I think all the other illnesses from our hospital, we report dengue, we report chikungunya, we report leptospirosis, malaria, um, all these I think um, they are reportable and in pediatrics, very important, you have Fever with paralysis uh, or acute flaccid paralysis is reportable. Fever with rash is reportable. Yep. Fever with membrane in the throat is reportable. Absolutely. Fever with parotid swelling is reportable. All these are reportable diseases. Yes. But they're not the jail kind of reportable. <laughs> <laughs> Only TB is the jail kind. Yeah, the yeah. next next most dangerous one not to report is the AFP, the acute flaccid paralysis. They will come and haunt you if you have missed and they have picked up. Because that's a polio surveillance. In the, in the incidentally detected HBSAG positive person, I'm not saying mother, but pregnant or non-pregnant, what protocol should be followed for the patient? So now there is also treatment for the mother because they do actually HBV DNA in the mother and I don't remember the cutoff, but if the mother's HBV DNA is above a certain limit, then these mothers are put on anti-HBS um, hepatitis B drug like I think tenofovir which reduces her viral load and reduces the risk of transmission to the baby. So that is the first step. The second step is that if the mother is HBV positive, then when the baby is born, you have to give Hep B immunoglobulin to the baby and you have to give the Hep B vaccine within 12 hours of birth. If a culture is not possible, what is your first choice of antibiotic for diabetic cellulitis? So this. most of the diabetic cellulitis, I mean, is 
I would think of the common pathogens, you know, like streptococcus, maybe anaerobes, etc. So I would still start with coamoxiclav in these patients. Um, then you have a different set of patients who have received coamoxiclav who are not getting better. And sometimes, you know, in these patients, the error which is made is that they do a surface swab because there's some ulcer and that swab shows some organism which is highly drug resistant. You don't, remember, you don't have to give treatment on the basis of what is growing on the surface cultures. So, um, th that is there. Who should be given leptospirosis prophylaxis? Children okay. and adults. So, there were some interesting uh, things which were discussed about leptospira. I just want to add a couple of things here that we, ha we saw plenty of leptospirosis this year and we unfortunately lost four patients in our hospital. And when we went into the history of all these patients who came with leptospirosis, not a single person had waded through water, okay? Mm -hmm. So there were people who had just gone out of their house to the market, maybe exposed. So it is a little unsettling thing, you know, that you can get leptospirosis, fatal leptospirosis, even with minor exposure. But, you know, aside from that point, if you have a person who has really had a long time wading in water, like one of those days, which are the, these days, then people would take leptospira prophylaxis. And once you take, and the dose is 200 milligrams of doxycycline, single dose, or 10 mg per kg of azithromycin, in children below the age of eight years. Now, sometimes what happens is, patient has got exposed today, uh, tomorrow you give prophylaxis and the rain continues for a week. Then after two days, they are again exposed. So one dose of prophylaxis lasts for one week. Okay. So if you have repeated exposure, and like, for example, in Andaman Nicobar Islands, where leptospirosis is highly prevalent, they give weekly doxycycline for as long as the exposure lasts. So, so that is just something that once you take it, it's for six, six, one week you are covered. For children, prophylaxis, Ch azithromycin, below 10 milligrams, below 8 years. Dose ke, I didn't get 10 that. mg per kg. But, uh, single dose, okay. It's yeah, I mean, if the child would have repeated exposure, then yes. Inadvertently given doxycycline below 8 years, single dose does not cause any major problem. Absolutely. It's not advisable. That is what she said. No, but you can still give. I yeah. mean, you know, doxy, so there is interesting, you know, doxy is not like the other tetracyclines. It does not bind to the bone and teeth. So actually, when you have a serious condition in a child who's less than, let's say, eight years, has scrub typhus with multi-organ dysfunction, we go ahead and give doxycycline. So even if you've given that doxy, the problem is in giving to children because there's no syrup formulation. It's a capsule, so it's difficult to give. But if you have to give, then the dose is 3 milligram per kg. When should the family physician suspect atypical pneumonia? We are going random because it's rapid fire. So how am I doing with time? <laughs> You're doing well. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. And just, can I just talk about that previous discussion about the molecular panel? See, one sure. thing which message which I want to give is, please don't do these molecular panels for your OPD routine cases. It is not worth it spending 10,000, 5,000 mm, for these patients because, um, you know, most of these patients will recover with just symptomatic treatment. Even your flu will recover with just symptomatic treatment. I think the main role of the upper respiratory panel is if you have a patient who gets hospitalized with a pneumonia. So, and all cases of pneumonia, you, are, you can't get sputum like children. So there you can do the upper respiratory panel because that may give you information on what is happening in the lung. So I would say that if you have a patient who gets admitted with a pneumonia, which looks like a viral pneumonia because you have diffuse infiltrates and all, then yes, you do the panel, but not for your routine OPD cases. And the same thing applies for the GI panel also because it is so expensive, like 10 to 15,000 the role of the GI panel is mainly for patients who have uh, immunocompromised with diarrhea, some cancer patient, some transplant patient, et cetera. There you should do it. And one problem with the GI panel is that it sometimes picks up four pathogens. If you see the results of the panel, Campylobacter, E. coli is there, Campylobacter is there, some adenovirus is there, Yersinia is there, et cetera, is there. So it is, that is a problem with that panel. So that use of that panel should be really restricted. And coming to your question, which is about atypical um, pneumonia, 
So remember that as per the guidelines, you cannot make a etiologic diagnosis of pneumonia based on the clinical presentation. That is why all the guidelines say that you have to use include a cover for atypical whenever you have a pneumonia, even in the outpatient and even in the inpatient. So if, if you have a patient in the outpatient, you would give maybe a mox plus azithromycin or uh, cefiroxime plus azithromycin. Or if you have an inpatient, you would give ceftriaxone with azithromycin. We should not use levofloxacin for treatment of atypical pneumonia in our country because it is a very, uh, many times TB also presents as a community acquired pneumonia. And if you give drugs like levoflox, you may mask the diagnosis. So, but specifically when you would suspect atypical pneumonia would be if your patient is having fever, if the patient is having rash, if the patient is having other extra pulmonary manifestations, if you find that there is hepatitis on the LFT report, or there is a rapidly dropping hemoglobin, which suggests that there is immune hemolysis occurring. So those would be specifically thinking that they could be atypical pneumonia. Is periodic deworming recommended? And do you use ivermectin ever? Periodic deworming is not recommended any longer because studies have shown that it does not impact nutrition. Also, the kind of patients who come to us in our clinical practice are not the ones who would get repeated worm infestations. Um, it's, uh, and also remember that the consequences of worm infestation is there if you have a high worm load in the intestine. And in that case, there will be worms which will come out in the stool. You can't have a huge load of ascaris in your intestines and not coming out in the stool. So periodic deworming is not recommended. Then coming to your second question about ivermectin, we sometimes I use it in my patients with scabies yes. and pediculosis. I mean, sorry, so I meant deworming with ivermectin there is something and called bandy plus you know bandy plus combination so no. clearly you are not using it no i mean you would use albendazole typically or in small children you would give pyrantel palmitate yeah so you know bandy plus right many of you have used bandy plus it's a combination of ivermectin with albendazole and is used for deworming even by gastroenterologists and so far i have not found any data to support a dual therapy for should we still use chloroquine as first line for, for YVAX? Yes, because um, uh, the problem is that the other alternative is artemether lumifantrine. Now, while that is a good drug, sometimes the you do see more relapses with um, uh, or recrudescence with um, artemether lumifantrine. So if you have to use an artemisinin-based combination therapy for YVAX malaria, then Synriam is better which is basically arterolene piperaquine. I think you have heard of that drug? Yes. So that is a better drug because the piperaquine has a higher uh, half-life. But um, so if your patient comes to you in the OPD with, and you have made a diagnosis of Vivax malaria, there are no complicating features. The patient is not vomiting. You can safely use chloroquine. Four plus flow, four plus two schedule. Four at zero hours four after 24 hours and two after 48 hours and follow it up with primaquine. But many times we see patients who are vomiting and you have a worry or they may have, you may have given them chloroquine and they've vomited. So in that case, you can use artemisinin based combination therapy and then you have to follow it up with primaquine as well. Should all pet lovers, that means including pet parents as they would like to call, take pre-exposure rabies prophylaxis? Absolutely. Because the guidelines are clear that even if your pet dog is vaccinated, if you, if you are bitten by that vaccinated pet dog, you will still have to take the full post-exposure prophylaxis, including the immunoglobulin. And you know that these pets bite on the face, they bite on the fingers, where giving immunoglobulin is really a problem. So everybody should take pre-exposure prophylaxis. And even if after taking pre-exposure prophylaxis, if the pet has bitten you, then after, as per the guidelines, you would still have to take two doses on day zero and day three. Can you give us some examples of pet-associated unusual infections that you have seen? I remember one infection called, due to Pasturella. Pasturella multisoda is a bacteria, and it is usually associated with cat and, uh, um, you know, uh, dog bites. So I had this lady who came with a bite on the palm and then she had a real prolonged course and we actually 
grew, grew two organisms. We do pasturella and we drew, grew salmonella also from the same patient because you know these patients, these dogs and cats can also have salmonella. And the drug of choice for management of pet bite is amoxiclav. That's the drug of choice. Anything special with these uh, turtles and lizards and salamanders that they keep? Anything special with that? <laughs> I, I really don't know. But I know that if you have bite with any no cold-blooded animal, you don't need rabies prophylaxis because you have had patients coming with turtle bite or these bites, you don't need to give rabies prophylaxis because rabies is a disease of warm-blooded animals. Because there was some talk about them harboring salmonella, non typhi salmonella as common sal and then so on. The question. What is the role of fluoroquinolones outside of tuberculosis today? So, so we are talking about two types of fluoroquinolones. One is the older ones, that is ciprofloxacin and ofloxacin. And the other is new ones like levofloxacin and moxifloxacin. So cipro, oflox, the problem is that earlier we were using a lot of these antibiotics for UTI and for gastroenteritis, but now there is so much resistance in your urinary pathogens and in your shigella that they have really become obsolete. And many times you have this ciplox TZ is a very favorite drug, you know, for diarrhea. Because, but remember that if you really have shigella diarrhea and you use a drug which does not work for Shigella, you are actually increasing the severity of the diarrhea because what that Ciplox does is it destroys your other gut bacteria which will be competing with the Shigella for the food and then the Shigella proliferates. So if you are using the wrong, either you don't use an antibiotic. If you decide to use an antibiotic, then you please use the right one. So if you use Cipro for bloody diarrhea, you are doing patient greater harm. So Ciplox has no role in gastroenteritis, where it is most commonly used. Similarly, it is hardly of any use for cystitis or pyelonephritis because 90% of the pathogens are resistant. So the role of these two drugs has become very limited. Um, and the newer fluoroquinolones are excellent drugs for upper respiratory tract, for you know, sinusitis, otitis media, pneumonia, but we should not use these drugs for that purpose because they are very important TB drugs. So I would really limit the use of fluoroquinolones. I Thank don't know you. if you have what. I think prostatitis, uh, some people use in acute prost bacterial prostatitis, still they use ofloxacin or ciprofloxacin, not levo uh, moxie. So yeah, the, as, as a rule, I mean, all, all family physicians, we have to abandon yes. fluoroquinolones. I would say norfloxacin also. There is, is there any use of norfloxacin in diarrhea? So nothing, no yeah. quinolones yeah. in OPD use, I think, is the rule. Yeah. Not in pediatrics, at, for sure. How does one suspect scrub typhus? Oh, we've we seen, uh, we right? just, and uh, again, scrub typhus has moved out of the forest, okay? So recently we had a 72-year-old lady who does, has not traveled anywhere. She just goes down in her society garden. And she came with fever, thrombocytopenia, and ARDS. And mm. we found that she had an SCHAR on her this, And her scrub typhus IgM was positive. So please remember that you don't need to have that classical exposure of going hiking in a forest for thinking. So think of scrub typhus when your patient comes with fever. Along with fever, they may be... They may or may not be a rash because 20% patients only have the SCHAR. But your lab parameters will give you a clue that your WBC count will be high, your platelets will be low, your CRP will be high, your PCT will be high, you may have mild transaminitis, and you may have mild elevation of creatinine, a kind of picture which looks a little bit like leptospirosis. And your patient has not responded to beta-lactam antibiotics. We'll give the basics here for them. What is the organism causing scrub typhus? Rickettsia susugamushi. And uh, it is, what is the vector? It is the trombiculid mite. It's a mite. So this mite bites you. What is an SCHAR? So SCHAR is the small area of necrosis or a thing which is produced at the site of the mite bite. Now it is also very interesting that when the mite bite travels up your body, it stops at areas where there is resistance. So the SCHAR is most commonly found in the private parts. 
it's found in the axilla it is found below the breast so it is not and it is painless okay so therefore you will miss it unless you actually look for it that is the schr and if you have seen an schr means it's a 100% specific but remember that 70% of the cases will not have an schr so the igm will help yes then that is why all patients coming sick patients coming to the hospital with fever with thrombocytopenia which looks like a tropical fever syndrome we give ceftriaxone and doxycycline empirically to everybody because you don't want to miss scrub typhus and then you can do either a rickettsial pcr in the first 5 to 7 days or beyond that you can do a scrub typhus igm so next to that uh, how do you suspect brucellosis or when do you suspect brucellosis so any patient with puo any patient who comes with spondylodiscitis these are the two common uh, presentations um and you normally in any occasion of puo you have to ask for history of unpasteurized milk intake or ask for history of exposure to cattle and sometimes that history of unpasteurized milk intake may not be very forthcoming they you will but you have to ask them ki doodh tabele ka aata hai ya packet ka aata hai dahi kahan se laate hain aap because sometimes they get dahi from outside which may be made from unpasteurized milk so these are the kind of things you would Uh, and then if your patient has um, you know uh, the cbc picture is really unremarkable but wherever you are thinking of tb you should also think of brucellosis as a possibility are you seeing reemergence of syphilis as they are seeing in the us have you seen cases yeah i mean we have seen a couple of cases of congenital syphilis uh, we have seen uh, it in uh, male homosexuals because nowadays many of these people are Uh, coming up uh, you know it's becoming i mean i don't know whether it's becoming more common but we are seeing in those patients but i would also urge you to not make diagnosis of syphilis on the basis of rpr or vdrl because vdrl 1 is to 2 1 is to 4 positive is a false positive so we should be careful in interpreting the results of the vdrl what is the dose and duration of itraconazole in tinea corporis is it a, an area that you cover yes so we are seeing difficult to treat tinea infections you have patients who are not responding but among all the drugs grisofulvin terbinafine and itraconazole the itraconazole it has the best effects and you don't need to use more than 200 mg a day so 100 mg twice a day with a fatty meal for 2 weeks is the duration many many dermatologists have started using 200 twice a day etc i actually reviewed this topic recently and i didn't find any evidence and we must remember that itraconazole has hepatotoxicity so if your patient is on prolonged itraconazole therapy you have to uh, watch for the liver functions and another thing please don't use itraconazole in patients who have underlying cardiac disease or who have congestive cardiac failure because it can worsen that so that is also one thing you must remember and just one last one there is an sb variety supra bioavailable or something like that do you think that itraconazole is better than the standard one <clears throat> i don't know because i don't know if they they are calling it sb but whether it is really sb or not but the itraconazole syrup is now available in india which has better bioavailability the problem with that itraconazole syrup is that it's not it causes a lot of nausea etc so you wouldn't use it in your standard cases of tinea but if you have a patient with histoplasmosis let's say you want to use itraconazole then maybe you could choose that what oral antibiotics do you think are less effective today due to resistance which were useful earlier so ciprofloxacin then uh, your cephalosporins because of emergence of esbl these are um, you know and then use of drugs like azithromycin for upper respiratory tract infections because most of the pneumococci hib are resistant thank you so much that was i think uh, we have uh, done our questions i would have loved to have interaction but i think we are short of time so uh, will not useful for tinea corporis not useful for tinea yeah sorry again it depends on which type of tinea you are dealing with but you would give 2 weeks in some patients you would need to give it on ecomycosis you may have to give for 3 to 6 months as well uh we will take questions later uh, maybe you can post the questions and again i'll take an obligation because our third speaker has also arrived and uh
we are having a break now. Uh, first of all, we'll thank Dr. Uh, Tanu Singhal for... Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for the presentation. I'm so glad you came. And of uh, course, <laughs> absolutely useful. And it'll be on YouTube today itself. So we will send it to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Before uh, you leave, just a small announcement. Uh, Tanvi here will be outside. If you can spare some time to give some video testimonials to her uh, about our sessions, that will be great for promoting our third session. So uh, please do that. And uh, sorry. And we have some, some people had requested for a cash donation uh, box. So we have kept one small box here. Uh, so if anybody wants to give, thank you. And uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes, please, because the speaker has arrived. Is uh, Dr. Lena Bhagat here?
if you can uh, if you wish to register today itself uh, please do so because the registration slips are there with dr mehmood merchant dr gwalani yeah cash box uh, is not here but you can give it to my assistant right you can pay uh, you can give cash donations later uh, if you wish to yeah also uh, uh phones on silent uh, or vibrator mode please before i call our next speaker ek uh, kavita pesh karna chahta hu medic uh, purani kavita hai lekin medically मॉडिफाई की गई है ताकि मेडिकल ऑडियंस के लिए ज़्यादा एंटरटेनिंग हो आप आई डोंट नो इफ यू हैव बीन कंपेयर्ड एज अ स्पाउस टू अदर पीपल नो मतलब मेरी पत्नी अक्सर मुझे कहती है कि फलाना तो वो है ऐसा है वहाँ लेकिन तुम क्यों ऐसे हो तो पुराने ज़माने में जब तुलना करते थे कंपेरिजन करते थे तो अच्छी तरह से करते जैसे फिल्मों में थे एक सती सावित्री नाम की फिल्म थी जिसमें मन्ना डे और लता का एक गीत था और उसमें कैसी तुलना होती है कि तुम गगन के चंद्रमा हो मैं धरा की धूल हूँ तुम प्रणय के देवता हो मैं समर्पित फूल हूँ मीरा बाई कैसी तुलना करती थी कृष्ण भगवान के साथ कि तुम भय मोती प्रभु जी हम भय धागा तुम भय सोना हम भय सो ऐसी तुलना अगर आज का मजनू मॉडर्न रोमियो करे तो कैसे करे कि तुम पाली हिल का पेंट हाउस माई लव मैं धारावी की खोली तुम फ्री किक रोनाल्डो की मैं मोहन बगान का गोली तुम भीष्म की बाण शैया माई लव मैं आईसीयू फाउलर बेड तुम तुम फ्लेमिंग का पेनिसिलिन सखे मैं फकत मोल्डी ब्रेड तुम ऋतिक की सिक्स फिंगर माई लव मैं इन ग्रोइंग टू नेल तुम कैशलेस सी ए बी जी मैं कैटरेक्ट बिल रिटर्न इन ब्रेल तुम लैंडसेट का पेपर डियर मैं व्हाट्सएप फॉरवर्ड ज्ञान तुम ब्रांडेड कैल्शियम विथ डी थ्री मैं चूना युक्त हूं पान तुम गृहस्थी लालू प्रसाद की मैं राहुल का कंट्रोल तुम राम जी की चरण पादुका मैं फ्लैटफुट का इन सोल तुम तुम इन 95 फाइव मास्क हो लव मैं सार्स को भी टू तुम घने बालों की उलझी लट मैं लट में उलझी जू तुम जाकोजी मैं लू ये होता है आइए लेट इज वेलकम डॉक्टर फुल रेनु चौहान प्लीज कम एंड डॉक्टर तुषार पणियार प्लीज ऑन स्टेज थैंक यू सो मच फॉर कमिंग थैंक यू यू टेक द सीट दिस विल बी योर माइक मुनिया यू Did I give my mic to somebody? Only I'm only one. Chacha ki hai na. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fulrino uh, is an endocrinologist, head of department of Hindu Jaw Hospital Endocrinology Department, and uh, yeah, we welcome you. And um, as is the tradition here, we we don't introduce. we take an introduction extract an introduction from you so uh, first of all uh, that's a beautiful sari where did you get it the shar must be one of those few husbands who's been told by the wife you better buy me this and better know what i'm buying what you are buying so he knows all about sari yeah so uh, i'm sure all of you all do too the men folk 
So, okay, tell us about your family. You have. Uh, I can proudly say that I am a full-fledged GSI from 1982 onwards till about 2000, and then I've moved to Hinduja as a full-timer, and I'm still there. So I go. I'm full-time at Hinduja Mahim and Khar, and I live at Mahim, and I have two beautiful children. Uh, one daughter who's working with Bain Consultancy, and my son who's just finished his MBBS is preparing for NEET, which we don't know when it's going to happen. It keeps <laughs> on getting postponed. So uh, the years of doctors who pass out is just increasing and increasing, as we all know. You all must be so young and enthusiastic. By the time these little fellows grow old and get any degree, their passion, enthusiasm, everything is gone. It's a sorry state. But I'm very happy to be here at this symposia, wherein we are not just talking, talking, talking. We are going to interact. And I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot from my teachers, whom I have a great respect. In fact, I was telling Dr. Shah that it's so nice that general practitioners exist and should continue to exist. Because what you have acquired over the years is something which, which we can't learn in the books. And most of the GPs today, as we call them GPs, are rather of other alternative specialities. And uh, that, that is really very sad. So I hope to add to this continuing education of my fellow colleagues and my dear teachers. And you all are really required by the community. So many of our patients say that, where are they? That comfort, that time, that uh, that passion, that understanding, that not so much for money, uh, those people have gone. So I just hope Dr. Tushar and the entire committee, please, please continue this beautiful thing that you are expanding. And I hope your patients and the community does understand and continues to understand the value of general practitioners. I'm for you all uh, and with you all all the time. Thank you. Wow. Uh, what are your passions outside of medicine? Uh, I like mythology. So actually I've done a course at Kalina University on uh, Indian mythology and other things. Though I, I don't come from a very spiritual or a religious background. Uh, along with Dr. Lena, uh, I love trekking. We go for many treks together. And I love reading. I don't like the, the blue screen at all. I'd rather read a book. And I find great comfort in that. As of now, that's all. Wow. OK, so the format of today's lecture, as we did with Dr. Tanu Singhal, also is questions and answers. We have 20 questions for you, and uh, maybe 21. And uh, we would, we'll have one hour. Uh, to, so we are trying to do a quick uh, round. So all the questions are very pointed. So I'm sure you will be able to identify with them easily. So first, we have questions on thyroid disorders. And the first question is, when does one start thyroxin in subclinical hypothyroidism? I'll just give a basic of that. Subclinical hypothyroidism refers to a TSH level, say, between 5 and 10, and a normal T3, T4, and is irrespective of clinical symptoms. This is the biochemical definition. So do you give, and when do you give thyroxin? So uh, this is a very, very good question. And all of us, including us, are faced with this dilemma. So uh, if the, as he correctly said, if the TSH is more than seven, irrespective yep. to the presence of uh, symptoms or no symptoms, we do start treatment, especially in those patients wherein it's indicated, like uh, during IVF or art therapy, planning pregnancy, or there's a nodule which is, or a gland which is growing, if there's a family history of thyroid, if there's a family history of autoimmune disorders, and if there are symptoms which are classically suggestive of hypothyroidism. Now, uh, of course, it doesn't mean that if the antibodies are negative, you don't start treatment. When the TSH is more than seven, even if T3, T4 are normal, we do start treatment. Also, we explain to the patient that probably this is a trial because most of the patients believe that Jobi Hora wo thyroid ke karan ho hai. So we also tell them, especially in those with negative antibodies, that we'll give you a trial for three months. Let's see how you feel. Those patients who are undergoing treatment for pregnancy, 
uh, irrespective of whatever is the TSH. Once it's more than three, irrespective to T3, T4, we put them on therapy. We don't even look at the antibodies. And urine, it's clear-cut guidelines which say that once the patient delivers, you have to reassess and then decide whether you need to continue thyroxine or no. Nowadays, there's a new guideline which has come up that there are many patients in whom we may start uh, T4, and if they are not very happy, then we try to, uh, even if T4 is slightly on the lower side of normal and TSH is borderline, we start with a very, very small dose of thyroxine and then we look at T4 and try to keep T4 in a normal range. TSH has to be between one and three while the patient was on treatment. So this is the manner in which we try to treat. It may be a temporary solution, it may be long term. Okay. Uh, what is the target of TSH in pregnant women? Do you go so below 2.5? Is that all? Or even yeah, lower? So first trimester, we do look at between 1 and 2.5. The second and third trimester is 3, between 1 and 3. Also, let me uh, share this with you that it's an overhype. I mean, sometimes we follow that biochemistry so stringently that, uh, you know, patients have to keep on doing the test. They are so hassle, so stressed out. So even if it's a little on the higher side, provided T3, T4, or free T3, free T4 are normal, if it's slightly higher, it doesn't matter. What are the treatment options in viral thyroiditis? I'll just brief them again. Viral thyroiditis is in a form of fever which is subacute and you get anterior neck pain which may radiate to the ears and the patient has possibly high WBC count, high ESR, high CRP. High T3, T4, low TSH, very uh, typical presentation of thyroiditis, viral thyroiditis. Uh, there, since there is some confusion about outpatient medication, what to start or if at all to treat? Yes, sir. most of the times if they are symptomatic, we have to treat. And now with increasing viral infections post-COVID or whatever it may be, we find more and more people coming with sore throat and then they do the T3, T4, TSH and they find that the TSH is slightly low. Now, if there are no symptoms, we needn't do anything. Uh, we will have to reassess the thyroid functions maybe after two to three months because sometimes the viral thyroiditis may go towards hypothyroidism. That apart, in asymptomatic patients, we just wait and watch. In those who are symptomatic, we always start with paracetamol in three or four divided doses. If that doesn't work, we don't wait for a week or 10 days, we immediately put them on an anti-inflammatory, which is quite uh, sort of strong like uh, enzoflam or chimoral forte and three times a day. Because if it is very painful, a single tablet is not going to do the job. And uh, urine, we wait for about five to seven days. Most of them have resolution of pain. And then because of the side effects of these anti-inflammatories, we tell them now you go back to paracetamol. However, there are a good number who do not settle down with these anti-inflammatories uh, anti or antipyretics and who need steroids. So uh, we do a CBC, ESR, nowadays everybody does a CRP as a baseline test. We don't look at the antibodies yet over here because it really doesn't change the treatment aspect and we start them on small doses of uh, prednisolone. We prefer prednisolone rather than uh, dexamethasone or hydrocortisone because it's long acting, has fewer side effects and can be weaned off or taper off very easily. We generally start at uh, 15 to 30 milligrams in divided doses. Also antacids have to be given. And there is a miraculous disappearance of pain in subacute thyroiditis with steroids. However, we all know that the thyroiditis and the inflammatory process takes a while to settle down. So every three to five days, we rapidly bring down the dose say by five milligrams or 10 milligrams. Over, so the next two to three weeks, we come down to perhaps half a tablet of five milligrams, two or three times a day. We tell them, do not stop. Let's reassess with CBC, ESR, the symptoms. And then we say that after a month, perhaps we can stop treatment and see. By this time, after four to six weeks of thyroiditis, the thyroid does start recovering from the inflammatory process the levels do start coming down. But often we have seen in our clinical practice, some take about three months or suppose we rapidly bring down the steroids, the minute you stop, it recurs. Those patients are very, very uncommon or rare. 
So in case that happens, we give them steroid on a very, very small dose of 2.5 milligrams for a longer time. The other thing that I might want to add is that uh, most of these patients with severe subacute thyroiditis invariably land up with hypothyroidism. So the degree of inflammation and the destructions caused by the antibodies is equally proportionate to the number that will become hypothyroid. And you would monitor, therefore, the TSH yeah, yeah. on a periodic basis. Yeah. Sometimes when it comes down rapidly and you don't feel the need to give steroids, what happens is that next time there is a seasonal change or another viral episode, it gets flared up again. Mm -hmm. So these things can happen from time to time. When there are multiple episodes of a similar thing, then ultimately they do become hypothyroid. In a hypothyroid, sorry, can a newly detected Graves disease be managed by a general practitioner? Uh, I wouldn't really agree with that because we also say, we all know that there are two main causes of hyperthyroidism. One is Graves' disease, wherein the thyroid gland is overproducing, synthesizing T3 and T4, and hence that is high and TSH is suppressed. And the other one is following a subacute thyroid illness, where T3, T4 is also high, symptomatically they, are, they can be as bad as Graves' disease and TSH is suppressed. Now, herein, if we do not differentiate the cause, we will treat them wrongly. Very often we have seen that immediately, even if there are no symptoms of thyroid, uh, thyroiditis, the patients are put on carbimazole or PTU more rarely. And the pain and the symptoms will not disappear. Perhaps it will go down a lot. So urine, it's very, very important that the cause of hyperthyroidism be identified. And we have to tell the patients, we can give them symptomatic management with propranolol or whatever, uh, the, the, the anti-inflammatories, anti-pyretics. And we like to do a technician scan of the thyroid, which is easily available, just to differentiate one from the other. Also, patients like to know that this is not a long-standing illness, and maybe in two to three months, it will recover. So very, very important for us to know the cause and treat accordingly. The commonest cause of hyperthyroidism, where you might have T3 toxicosis or just T4 toxicosis, iatrogenic. There are many, many people nowadays who use thyroxin for weight loss in nutraceuticals, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they try to give too much of thyroxine and patients, especially elderly patients, can land up with hyperthyroid symptoms, which we will not be able to differentiate one from the other. Especially in elderly with graves, you do not have the classical symptoms. You don't have the goiter. So there it can be mistaken. So you are seeing such iatrogenic, yes, where yes. people take supplements. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, in a hypothyroid patient, apart from thyroxine, which other medicines or supplements may need to be prescribed? Because there are many supplements promoted, thyro well and thyro something. What supplements are really necessary in a hypothyroid? What we tell our patients and what is generally believed is that uh, once the thyroid is controlled, you don't need anything at all. What it may cause as a loss like B12 or D3, that's different. But nowadays, there is some talk and some research which says that selenium perhaps helps and recovers both in hyper, in fact, at hyperthyroidism due to Graves and hypo as well. We have not found any difference and I wouldn't really recommend that. You know, these minerals and trace elements are so expensive and the manner in which it is just thrown at the patient, it's unbelievable. I wouldn't recommend it. Right. Uh, please tell us some hacks or tricks in thyroid dose adjustment, thyroxine dose adjustment, including the role, if any, of leothyronin. First of all, the hack hacks, meaning there are some people who will give Saturday, Sunday more medicine or alternate day or all the days, seven days together dose. Tell us something about the variations in the standard dosing. So one thing that we keep uh, treating the, pa uh, telling the patient, you know, most of the patients I'm sure you found come, says that, Dr. Ye T3 to kam hota hi jata hai. So what do we do about it? So when we write a prescription of the thyroid functions, we write T4, TSH. Of course, all the labs do the entire profile. And then you find that the T3 is going down. And invariably, they feel that the thyroid functions are not controlled. 
Now, we all know that in hypothyroidism, it's T3 and T4 both go down. And when we are giving thyroxine, we are only giving T4. So we should look at T4 and TSH and not T3. So that is one such thing uh, that we face all the time. And we really tell the patients that do not do T3. So often we have references, patients spend money waiting, etc., just for this one thing that T3 Q come here. So we should not look at T3 unless there's a problem like there is T3 toxicosis or there's a multinodular goiter which secretes more of T3. Second thing is that when we are treating a thyroid patient, we should only look at TSH. Very often we as endocrinologists ask only for TSH because that's the only way of monitoring the doses of thyroxine. So we, uh, most often people on treatment, depending upon the age, we like to keep TSH between one and three. And elderly people, we like to keep it between one and five. In children, we are a little more careful. We keep it right between one and three. And if there's a slight uh, upper niche, we really don't chase it. So uh, sometimes, as uh, Dr. Shah has said, that sometimes a particular dose for the entire week may not work. And if we say, for example, increase from 100 to 125, it becomes too much. So that weekend uh, uh, dose adjustment makes a big difference. And especially in elderly individuals with cardiac problems or uh, people who are thin, losing weight and all that, we like to start minuscule doses. And even we are surprised that 12.5 or 25 also makes a big difference. An extra 12.5, 25 on the weekends. Yeah. yeah. And that is easier because uh, you break the tablet or you buy an extra one. People do forget, I accept. But if you want to give 112 daily, it's better to give 150 once a day or twice a day than twice a week. 112 mm -hmm. that way. So it helps us in fine tuning the TSH values. Now talking about T3, uh, for the longest of time, T3 was not available. Of course, many people in this city were using T3. It was extremely expensive. And most of us felt that T3 is not really required. But there are particular indications which have been put forth by the Thyroid Association all over the world. So very often you might find that even if T4 TSH is normal, your patients are not happy. They continue to have symptoms suggestive of hypothyroidism. So in such patients, we can use small doses of T3. So you can use five uh, micrograms or 10 micrograms once or twice in a week. And it may or may not make a difference. I, I, we, can, we have to make it very, very clear to the patient that, that this is a trial. And like all thyroid medications, you have to try for two to three months because it's so slow. And we all know that every part of the body does not respond to thyroxine in the same way. For example, in the elderly, the heart reacts immediately, but maybe the, the swelling will remain, maybe the tiredness and fatigue will take a long time. Nowadays, we see most of the young crowd who are working, they say that no matter what we do, we are always tired, always fatigued. So if you find that the T3 is on the lower side, if there are no contraindications like the heart, osteoporosis, etc., you can give a trial of T3 with starting with a small dose of five to 10 micrograms. We still do not have five to 10 microgram tablets available. We have 20 micrograms, so they can cut it. Another indication wherein we do use T3 is that when a patient is operated for a differentiated thyroid cancer, and we are awaiting the histopathology, we all know that after the thyroid cancer is confirmed, we have to wait for three to four weeks. We have to allow the TSH to go up then check if there is anything remaining or there are mets. Now at this time, before doing the scan or the thyroglobulin levels, we want the TSH to rise to more than 30, right? Because the uptake of thyroid anywhere in the body is dependent on TSH. So as they start rising, na, many patients are so sensitive, their lifestyle is totally messed up and they cannot tolerate the symptoms of hypothyroidism. So urine, we start thyroxine, maybe 20 milligrams twice a day, or uh, leothyronin twice or three times a day, and a week or 10 days before the radioactive iodine scan, we stop it. So at least that, uh, generally we don't start anything for a month, and they are miserable for a month. Here we can give it for two weeks, 
stop only for two weeks so that they are not miserable, they don't have any real complications of severe hypothyroidism. That I believe is the, the uh, main indication. indication. The third main indication is those ladies who are undergoing treatment for infertility or pregnancy, wherein we find that we know that T4 takes a much longer time to stabilize the thyroid functions. So you're in, we can start T3 and allow the, uh, the functions to come down normal, the TSH to come down within the range, and then gradually withdraw it once TSH is controlled. So just again, leothyronin is available now, and that is T3. And what we use is levothyroxine, which is our T4. Okay, uh, how does one approach a euthyroid goiter? Goiter, cosmetically disturbing or not disturbing, and T3, T4, TH normal. So again, it all depends on the age. If it's a young child, we really go after it because in children, goiters are not supposed to happen till puberty. So if you have a two or a four or a five-year-old having a goiter, we have to evaluate because it could be cancer. Uh, medullary thyroid cancers can be present in children. Differentiated, that is papillary and follicular cancers are not very, very often. As the child grows and becomes juvenile and reaches heads towards puberty, it's a pubertal goiter because of increasing requirement that goes up. Also, an, a proportion of, especially the girl child, might develop autoimmune thyroiditis, what we call Hashimoto's at this time, and they have sky high levels of anti-TPO uh, antibodies. There's one thing which I want to em emphasize is that nowadays if you go to the lab and ask for thyroid antibodies, they'll do anti-thyroglobulin antibodies and anti-microsomal or anti-TPO antibodies. About 10 to 15 percent of normal population have high levels of ATA. So please do not give too much importance to ATA. It's the AMA or anti-TPO antibodies is what we are looking at. Also, I have seen a number of uh, doctors have started using TRAB antibodies. That is very, very, very specific and should not be done in just all patients with a goiter or thyroid disease. Coming back to a goiter, so pubertal goiters are common. They do remain after the puberty is gone, uh, after the child has grown. And as the person grows, if there is a goiter, if it's a simple goiter, most likely it will be thyroiditis, Hashimoto's. If it is nodular, we have to evaluate. So first thing is, even if T3, T4, TSH is normal, an ultrasound needs to be done from a good center. The nature of the nodule or the nodule should be looked at because certain characteristic features of nodules allows us to identify that this may be suspicious and then we need to do FNAC under USG guidance from again a good center. A multinodular goiters generally, unless there's a cold area or a hypofunctioning area, is not cancerous or malignant. There are various criteria given that which should you evaluate and which you should not. But a single nodule, a multinodular goiter, a goiter which is increasing in size, of course, those with compressive symptoms all need to be evaluated extensively. Goiters which come up in the elderly have to be evaluated. They may be functional. And in fact, we have seen a, long of, a large number of elderly individuals with long-standing goiters in our country who have subclinical hyperthyroidism where the TSH is on the lower side. So whether to treat this or no, again, depends upon a lot of factors. Okay. Uh, what is your opinion on iodized versus non-iodized salt debate? It has to be iodized. There's no questions about yeah. that. The Sindhava, very good. Sea salt, very, very nice. Himalayan, nothing. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, about bone health, how does one prevent or minimize osteoporosis in general? Prevent or minimize? So unfortunately, our country has so much of sunlight, but we don't get enough vitamin D. That is the worst thing. So we as students used to ask Dr. Bandarkar, who was my te uh, teacher, that all these urchins and poor children on the road, how come they are so deficient? How come rickets is so, so, so common? And there are factors. One is worms, poor nutrition. That is poor in... Nowadays, even in the healthy, so-called healthy young children, 
because of eating wrong things about not going out, not playing enough. But one thing I must em emphasize is that uh, peak bone mass is a single most important factor in all individuals. And that is attained, maximum is attained by the age of 20 to 25 years in everybody. We as Indians don't get enough. Like uh, when I was a child, my mother used to run with a glass of milk. I wish we would have listened and all our children would do that even today. Nowadays they drink milk, but it is ye, wo, God knows what. The milk which was pure, which came straight from the tabelas or from wherever it is, gave us a lot of calcium. It gave us, a, gave us lots of proteins. Today in the day of an era of skimmed milk and God knows what it is, we are losing all of that. So good nutrition with adequate proteins, milk and calcium containing substances in diet are very important. Again, besides milk and milk products, most of the things do not contain calcium. However, ragi, I believe, has enough calcium, which now again has come in vogue for whatever reason, and people are eating ragi. But food as such doesn't contain calcium. Our parents and grandparents never believed in giving calcium. But in today's day and age, where calcium and vitamin D is deficient, we should start giving calcium from birth onwards. During the growing period, we need to give at least 500 to 1,000 milligrams of elemental calcium to all children. We need to regularly deworm our children, whatever class of society it may be. Adequate protein has to be given. And most important, they have to be physically active. Because while bones are taken care of, the muscle development is very poor in today's children, though they love to go to the gym later on. So attaining the peak bone mass is very important with ad adequate calcium and vitamin D at all ages. After they've grown, they've, they come to middle age, at least 500 milligrams of elemental calcium of a good compound has to be given on daily basis. Most of our patients will say, kya calcium hamesha lena padega, ya constipation hota hai, ya kya kare. So you may take it from food or you may intermittently give calcium most people don't take. And vitamin D is very, very important. So what we generally do, we treat the entire families with six monthly courses of those mega doses of vitamin D. And if there is malnutrition, etc., again, that's a big problem, but at least something goes. Many of these people, as they grow up, women reaching menopause, again, that Indian mentality is there, including mine, that humko kuch zarurat ne itna tablets lena padega kya? People say calcium say stone hota hai. Mere ye wo falan dikan etc. Neighbor professors have said ke goliya acha nahi hai nahi lena chahiye. But that is really not correct as far as calcium and vitamin D is concerned, especially perimenopausal and postmenopausal. That myth of calcium forming stones is not correct. One thing that was new to us and uh, which we will need to implement. She spoke about peak bone mass. You know, it's like your height. Your height is settled by the age of whatever, 16, 15, whatever. Similarly, your bone mass or the weight of the bone in your body is settled by the age of 20, 25. And what she's recommending is even children should be given calcium, not just vitamin D, but supplementation of calcium, which I don't know if Maniar does or do you practice that? So for uh, standard recommendation? He's a pediatrician. Full-term normal grown babies, first year we only advise vitamin D, 400 international units, after one year, 600 international units. So the recommendation is to give only till two years. Most of us, as uh, doctor said, continue to give it as long as possible because for multiple reasons, the exposure of vitamin D is very low. The only thing that I would want to ask her is, what is the upper limit of vitamin D that you would give for children? Meaning, you know, the previous six lakh units and whether intramuscular adult injection should be used in pediatrics at all? No, I don't think that is really required. And uh, intramuscular, we had conducted a small little uh, thesis kind of a thing at uh, KEM when I was with Dr. Bandarkar. And we had given the same injection orally and then we had done the levels and it remains the same. But nowadays we do have alternatives which are as good or better than giving injections. And we really don't recommend uh, intramuscular vitamin D injections. Most of the orthopedic surgeons, they love this and they 
keep on giving, causing vitamin D toxicity, which is the other harm which is very florid in our society. So suppose a pa patient comes to you, then me. The first thing is vitamin D, Leah. The poor patient doesn't even know what is vitamin D. Saying, nahi, nahi, Leah. You keep on giving, you keep on giving. So we give a mega dose and then we maintain. And for adults, at least a tablet of, uh, say, calcium carbonate, whatever it may be, contains 400 IU of vitamin D, that is cholecalciferol, is enough to maintain after giving six monthly mega units. So we don't want to give too much and there should not be a deficiency as well. Uh, we go on to the next question in bone health. Uh, the question you've already given the answer to is, in your practice, how do you supplement calcium and vitamin D? In which individuals do you recommend the bone density test, DXA? The one more thing about calcium is that the compound is very important. And we need to, suppose you see uh, any medicine, there will be 1200 or 1600 milligrams of calcium. Now that is not important. There is something which is below that is elemental calcium. So the elemental calcium should be 500 milligrams. The compound is very, very important. Calcium carbonate, calcium acetate, calcium citrate. Each of this give different amount of calcium. And here we use calcium carbonate extensively because one gram of uh, elemental calcium, one gram of calcium, that calcium carbonate gives 400 milligrams of elemental calcium. So we give two in elderly people. We still don't use the recommendations used by the uh, Western people of giving 1,000 milligrams because many people can't digest calcium. But ek to lelo, that way. Uh, about bone, bone density, density uh, again, there are different recommendations for males and females. Uh, if you see the population at large, all females post-menopause after the age of 60 or 65 should undergo uh, bone density, irrespective of whether there are fractures, symptoms or no. And all men more than 70, 75 years of age have to undergo a bone density. Of course, there are indications is that suppose you are much younger and suppose there's a fragility fracture, whatever may be the age, you have to undergo a bone density and the gold standard for bone density is DEXA. Very important to use the same center whether it's holistic is the machine or whether it's Luna, you have to use the same center because there are differences which are seen by different center. And depending upon the type of osteoporosis, you can do it either every year or once in two years. Uh, the other indications for doing a bone density in the young is if there are risk factors. Suppose a patient is on long-term steroids. By long-term, I mean that any patient who takes more than 15 milligrams of prednisolone or its equivalent for more than three months is likely to develop uh, glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. So these patients' bone density have to be done and then treatment suggested. All patients with rheumatoid arthritis who are postmenopausal or into that particular age, then if there are hormonal deficiencies, if there are multiple fractures, if there is likelihood that this patient is at risk, very, very thin individuals who are hyperthyroid for a long time can undergo bone density at a younger age. But the age cutoff is always more than 50, and in general population, it's more than 60, 65, or 70 in men. Women here who are above the age of 60, please raise your hand. Above the age of 60, please raise your hand. And you can put the hands down and raise them again if you are a woman above 60 and not done a DEXA, not done a DEXA. How many of you have not done a DEXA? Please raise your hand. Women, 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 women. women. All women in the front row, you've all done a DEXA? Okay, that's nice. And men above 70, how many of you have not done DEXA? Not done. Men are more careless than women. Yeah. Also because as a, as a country, we are deficient from birth, nutritionally, calcium-wise, etc. So do we do follow the Western cut, uh, bone density uh, cutoffs that are given, but we are more at risk at a lower. For example, if the definition of bone density is minus less than minus 2.5, so we are at a risk at 2 or even 1.5. So many uh, people have started using that osteopenia definition 
for Indians for uh, starting treatment. We have still not started doing it, but probably Maybe. we need some more Indian data for that. So I, I was coming to that. Uh, comment on bisphos. We know that there are three therapies principally available for osteoporosis besides calcium and vitamin D is denosumab, uh, bisphosphonates, and teriparatide. Your experience with each, are they overused, underused? Uh, where uh, I think the diagnosis is at a stake wherein we don't consider all the factors and diagnose correctly. So by certain societies, the medical so societies for everything they start, uh, the bisphosphonates or denusumab. And as a new drug comes into the market, especially because of the pharma companies, we all are pushed to use a particular agent, which we should not. Uh, we all have extensive experience with bisphosphonates, which is very, very uh, simple, relatively no side effects, and can be used either weekly, monthly, or annual. Um, uh, annually, it can be given parenterally. Of course, up till now, we never knew for how long should be used. And we always thought it is safe to give this because they make the bones solid. But today we know that there are side effects with long-term uses. So nowadays there are these people on bisphosphonates or even denosumab who can have atypical fractures. What happens is that the bone becomes rigid like a pipe. It's more rigid than a cement pipe. And then like anything that is rigid, even a small little... Uh, Blue. accident or a blow can cause fractures and those fractures are very very typical um, we don't have enough experience with denusumab but it will happen because ultimately it does the same thing as far as indications of using uh, bisphosphonates or denusumab it's still the first line treatment if all over and it's probably cheaper but there are indications for use of teriparatide where there is severe osteoporosis where there is fractures while on bisphosphonate therapy. Uh, these are the two main indications where combination therapy with bisphosphonates and denosumab doesn't work and there is deteriorating bone density when we use teriparatide. We all know that using teriparatide is only once or it can be split into one year, one year. We, the, the, there is not too much of uh, improvement in the bone density if you use it more than 18 or 24 months nowadays. So wherein there is a huge risk where the bones are very, very poor, we do use teriparatide. And the important thing is that once you maintain or you acquire some bone density or improvement in the architecture, we have to give an anti-resorptive therapy to keep it at place. So most of us, what we do are those people who use it just like that randomly they do not back it up with anti-resorptive therapy. So we have an anabolic agent which we use to strengthen the bones and to back up the strength, we have to use uh, any anti-resorptive therapy. Bisphosphonate after denosumab or after teriparatide? No, no, bisphosphonate after or denosumab after teriparatide. After teriparatide. Uh, we as journalists principally use bisphosphonates. Uh, can you just give us one line uh, guidance as to when should we start a bisphosphonate in somebody who has never had a fracture? So after the age of 60 or 70, if you show osteoporosis, as per the guidelines, you start. So everybody who has minus 2.5 at least definitely yes. should be put on bisphosphonates for how long? Uh, data Five years? for 10 years is available, but we generally like to give a drug holiday for a year so that that uh, risk of brittle bones or fractures is avoided. So five years, one year gap, maybe five more years, yeah. something like that? Yes. Okay. Or and you give five years, if there is deterioration, you can add denosumab. Or if there's a fracture in that, then you give teriparatide. Correct. Okay. And the most important is please give enough of vitamin D and calcium. With teriparatide, what happens is if the PTH is raised, teriparatide is also PTH, then it doesn't work. So we want the PTH in the normal range. So give enough vitamin D and calcium no matter what is your treatment protocol. Uh, we go to diabetes. Uh, what is the role of HbA1c in your practice in both the diagnosis of diabetes and the monitoring of diabetes? So HbA1c, as we all know, that it is just an, it gives you an average 
to the mic. Ha, it gives you an idea of your previous three months, especially 60 days average blood sugar values. And it can be used as a diagnostic tool along with your fasting post-lunch or post-glucose blood sugar. Nowadays, of course, people come with an HbA1c of more than 6.5. And we do say that, yes, you have diabetes. But generally, we like to have a fasting post-lunch also. It can be used as a single tool to diagnose diabetes in both in type 2 diabetes, not type 1. And we use it as more as a follow-up tool. So very often, people are very smart. They'll diet for one week. They come with brilliant uh, reports. And they're saying, control and you do an HbA1c and it's 9 and 10. So therein it's very, very important. And we are at our level, we always insist at least quarterly or six monthly, you have to do an HbA1c. Are you happy with the point of care HbA1c machines that many of us keep in our clinics? Are you, are you okay with those? Yes, we are okay. And even in most of the labs, if the HbA1c is not done by a proper methodology, uh, it may give wrong readings. Also, while we are doing HbA1c, we have to look at uh, the hemoglobin values. So low hemoglobin will give you a wrong reading. If you have hemoglobinopathies, it will give you a wrong reading. If you have CKD with very low Hb, it gives all wrong uh, readings. So, uh, yes, you can use uh, your uh, clinic machines for... Ultimately, it's a screening test. Mm -hmm. So while it is used for diagnostics, but for an therapeutic follow-up, it's a good tool. Good tool. Uh, what is your take on the concept of pre-diabetes? As we know, pre-diabetes is impaired fasting glucose, say between 110 and 125, impaired glucose tolerance between 140 and 199, or HbA1c between 5.7 and 6.4. This is the pre-diabetes definition. What is your take on that? What is your take on the treatment of that? I think as Asians or Indians now, we are born with the wrong genes as far as diabetes or metabolic syndrome is concerned. Every Indian is prone to develop diabetes. And some of who are lucky are just because of good genes. Okay, and now I'm very happy actually with the concept because no person likes to be called a diabetic. So with this new concept, at least the Indian population, the younger population can be scared to believe that this pre-diabetes is going to get converted to diabetes unless you change your lifestyle. And in certain states in India, the conversion rate is up to 30 to 40 percent. It is that high. Also that concept of by the WHO or the American Diabetes Societies and all that, they say 126 cutoff of fasting is far too high. Okay. Yeah, so when you, in amongst Indians, even if it's more than 90 fasting in the younger age group, we start telling them that, look, you start working out, uh, do something, you are going to be uh, a diabetic very soon, especially if there are risk factors, obesity, family history, wrong lifestyle, so on and so forth. As far as treatment is concerned, of course, the first line of treatment is lifestyle modification and weight reduction. We all know that while we are small, we do have a propensity of developing belly fat. So even thin girls over here have some amount of a kilo or two of extra wrong fat in their, uh, in their viscera, visceral areas, which causes insulin resistance and pre-diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Also identifying pre-diabetes in the younger girls allows us to tell them that you may be at the risk of developing GDM during pregnancy, so be careful. In which pre-diabetic would you start metformin? Uh, I would like to start in all. But okay. of course, those who are vigilant, they are going to be a little more responsible. They will diet, exercise, etc. We give them a three-month or a six-month trial. And if there's any increase in the HbA1c, we say that you start metformin. Again, metformin, using the correct dose is very, very important. At least uh, 1,000 milligrams of metformin is required to make any difference at all. And as I said, we Indians are a special population. As against the other people who are controlled, the insulin levels are controlled with 1,000, we definitely need a higher dose. One important thing that she mentioned, which uh, was that the conversion rate of pre-diabetes to overt diabetes is as high as 30 to 40%, which is not the Western literature at least. And uh, 
This is in how many years the conversion from pre to over diabetes would be yeah. over how many years? So maybe over five years. I mean, most of the data is coming from South India, where anyway the incidence of type 2 diabetes is very, very high. But uh, with the IT companies, with the type of food that they eat, the conversion rate is maybe in two years, three years. It all depends upon different uh, uh, type of people and communities over here. So most of us here who diagnose, family physicians who diagnose impaired fasting glucose, impaired glucose tolerance, most of us, I think, do not start metformin. How many of you start metformin if you find IFG, IGT? All of you start, almost all patients who IFG, metformin. Okay, so the, the <laughs> along with lifestyle, of course, with especially obese patients or maybe childbearing uh, potential patients. Okay, what is... What are the Sorry? She is asking that some people don't tolerate yeah. metformin. So in pre-diabetes, is there any other option? So uh, we do start SGLT2 inhibitors nowadays as a first-line treatment, especially in obese who are 6.3, 6.4. Now more towards uh, diabetes, we do start. SGLT2, okay. What is the utility of, uh, what is your opinion of and experience with lifestyle management as a tool in controlling or reversing diabetes, reversing over diabetes? So there's a, there are many clinics all over the country. city and country for reversal, which are, I'm not talking about you and me, but people do such uh, atrocious things. Na. Uh, one such, I don't want to name, but they all come back to us finally. Again, lifestyle is the center uh, of all treatments, which most people don't get into. And it really requires a lot of uh, dieting, exercise, and uh, uh, mindful eating, thinking, to reverse diabetes just by lifestyle modifications. Uh, but here, metformin really makes a big difference. And people who are learned and really want to try, they can actually see a reversal of diabetes. But I tell all my patients, once you have an IGT or an impaired glucose fasting or intolerance or pre-diabetes, you'll always remain so. So as long as you correct your lifestyle, you monitor your sugars, visit your doctors, maybe you may be non-diabetic. But the minute you cheat for a long duration, you are going to jump back to becoming a pre-diabetic or a diabetic. That never goes away. So even the pre-diabetes cannot be cured. It can only be controlled. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the utility of CGM or continuous glucose monitoring in type 2 diabetes? Uh, that's another big thing which has come up. So in type 2 diabetes, we don't advocate using CGM except of those patients who have undergone uh, failure to OADs, large doses of sulfonylureas, etc., and who are likely to be on insulin, whatever may be the reason. And whereas children very easily adapt to doing uh, glucose monitoring, adults don't. And, uh, and they have so many complications. So those who are on insulin, multiple doses of insulin, we really advocate the use. And it's amazing because you can see what is happening to your blood sugar and that itself allows the patient to take action on motivated. time. Motivated. But some people who are non-diabetic also wish to be motivated by CGM. I know. I don't think that should be used. <laughs> Many patients will come to you, know, I put this, if I eat this put thing, then you know, suddenly there's a spike and then, yeah. Uh, some questions related to menstrual disorders and uh, female health. Is there effective pharmacotherapy for PMS and PMDD. Uh, is there effective pharmacotherapy? PMDD stands for premenstrual pre dysmorphic disorder disorders. and premenstrual syndrome. Uh, any, any, anything? Because this is a common thing. This is a reason for suffering. Yes, I think with working uh, women, it's becoming more and more troublesome because when you are at home, somehow we all manage. But when you are in your office and you have to do your best. That time, these kind of PMSs or PMDD really comes in the way of our performance. So uh, it all depends on the symptoms, of course, and the number of days. PMS is when it happens for a week or 10 days before your menstruation, and most often it is bloating, mood changes, um, 
feeling depressed, irritable, so on and so forth. And most women can manage uh, with whatever they are doing. Some people take painkillers, some take people uh, take mood elevators for a short time. Though I must say that most women do not like to take anything at all during this period. Those who have wild mood swings, we do start giving plant estrogens or primrosa oil, and that is a herbal therapy or naturopathic therapy, which is pro probably has some something to do with reducing this symptomatology. And the question is how much and how long? So if it is only for that said period, you can start it uh, seven to 10 days before you know that your menstrual uh, problems are going to start or when the symptoms come. And like uh, magic, it all disappears once you start menstruating. Now there are those people who, has who have dysphoria and they continue to have these symptoms even after the menses. This is more towards the older women and those who are coming towards menopause, where you need longer treatment. And your pharmacotherapy can be utilized. In women with severe PMS, the younger women, we do give OC pills uh, either for three months or low dose OC pills, three months or six months, wherein you abort your natural cycles and you just put them on those small doses of estrogen and progesterone. Of course, for obvious reasons, OC pills are not advocated for long-term use in women. And you can give them in breaks, you know. Nowadays, there are certain antidepressants such as your SSRIs or peroxetin or fluoxetin in very small doses make a very big difference in women who have persistent mood-related issues. And uh, you can give it for a short time, maybe three months, and stop it and see how you behave. In those who do not have a uterus or perimenopausal women or just post-menopause, who start developing mood changes. Again, peroxetin is the drug of choice, which you can give in small doses for longer times. You can give this flavonoids, which are available. And these are plant estrogens without any side effects. So there are, they are very, very useful for long-term use in perimenopausal and menopausal women, and practically no side effects at all. And uh, those who don't have a uterus, for whatever reasons, and go through hot flushes and all that, we can give those serms. We can give Tibolon for long periods, which also has some improvement or effect on the bone density. We can give Tamoxifen or their Agonis, which are used as anti-cancer treatments, which also have a good effect on the breasts and the uterus and a positive effect on that for short-term treatment. So it all depends on the symptoms for what the woman has come and what we like to give. Um, and I think it has made a big, big breakthrough, especially because more and more women are having problems. These antidepressants really make a big difference in uh, perimenopausal women or young women who are having severe mood-related issues. So uh, what she spoke about was just uh, paroxetine and fluoxetine belong to the SSRI group. And these two drugs, uh, especially paroxetine, has been useful. The only problem with paroxetine is it causes weight gain more than fluoxetine. Because fluoxetine may cause weight loss, but paroxetine may cause weight gain. So that you'll have to balance that. Uh, you spoke about the pharmacotherapy of menopause. Which I forgot, I'm yes. sorry. That many people have water retention. So for 10 days prior to the uh, menses, if it's very severe, we can use aldectone in very small doses. That is also acceptable. Uh, a little bit about weight. What is your experience with bariatric surgery for long-term weight loss? Do you advocate bariatric surgery, say, in the morbidly obese? And what is your experience about regaining weight, about other complications? Would you recommend it? So, of course, there are guidelines as to who should do bariatric surgery. So, morbidly obese people, BMI more than 35, earlier it was 40 with or without any risk factor, should undergo or think of bariatric surgery. Those who are, have a BMI of more than 30 or 32, with any metabolic risk factor, such as diabetes, heart disease, etc., etc., et sleep apnea, so on and so forth, should undergo bariatric surgery. And whatever may be the reason for which you've lost weight, 130 or 160 kilo uh, person 
even if they lose 25 kilos is not going to lose too much of weight. And suppose you use extensive dieting and all that and lose weight. The minute you come back to even slightly normal diet, they regain. There's a rebound phenomenon. So that's very, very depressing and disheartening. I, for one, we, I advocate bariatric surgery in patients which have, who have risk factors because it's not only the amount of fat which is important, it's what the fat is doing in the presence of risk factors. And the entire, especially when there is diabetes, uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, hyperuricemia, sleep apnea, all of that become normal. And long-term studies show that even if they start putting on weight, they put on a very small percentage of weight. The effect of bariatric surgery, again, there are different types which we use for different indications, remains for a longer time. So 160 kilo person, if he does a gastric bypass, can lose about 50 to 60 kilos of weight. As against that, depending upon a banding or a stapling, might lose about 20 to 30. So very, very important for the bariatric surgeon to decide and to discuss with the patient and family what is the expectation and what they must do. And results are really very good, in good hands. Also, it is seen as that with the lighter surgeries like banding or stapling, suppose you don't keep up with your diet, exercise, very slowly you put back the weight, but still it is not as much as you would do with just diet and exercise alone. Hinduja has an experience of how many bariatric surgeries you would think? We don't do bariatric surgery at Mahim, okay. but we do it at Khar and the, I wouldn't know the numbers, but whichever patients I have sent, they are extremely happy. In fact, all diabetics who are on multiple doses of insulin have stopped insulin. Uh, they've lost huge amounts of weight. They are leading such a good life. They are happy. And of course, the family is also happy. We are averting all the risk factors, cardiac, CVA, uh, the BiPAP machines, etc. Which was my uh, second question, so I'll skip that, about diabetes and bariatric. Uh, what is your opinion on GLP-1 receptor agonists as weight loss drugs, as we know, semaglutide, liraglutide, uh, uh, what is the third one? T. Terizopatide. Terizopatide is a twin creatine. Yeah. yeah. So, what, are, what is your opinion on those drugs as weight loss drugs? So, we all know that these GLP-1 receptor agonists came as anti-diabetic therapy. And while this was being done, initially it was thought because of the side effects, people were losing weight. But it also has its own inherent ways in which weight loss has been seen. So now the, the FDA, WHO has recommended as weight loss medications, even in non-diabetics. And uh, we use it extensively. Only thing, it's extremely expensive. And the expectation is too much again. If it is not backed by adequate dieting exercises, then the results are not as good. But the weight loss is good and secondarily, it keeps up with the late weight loss even after you stop the treatment. The problem with these medications are the initial side effects, which in a way helps and yet many people stop using or it. Or share vomiting basically. Yeah. yeah, yes. Okay, so your prescription of say semaglutide has increased. increased. And injectable semaglutide now is available. Yes. Uh, so, what that you are preferring that to orals in weight so, loss? So, uh, that is better because it's once a week. So, even if you have side effects which are like your oral semaglutide, at least you have enough time to recover it. I think some of the Indian companies will soon start making it. And uh, again, the expectation is too much. What I find is now that we've used it so often is that people think it's a miracle, a wonder drug and they just get disappointed. What they don't understand is that it has to be backed with enough dieting and exercises, yes. And of course, the diabetic management improves. The, the number of drugs go down, insulin doses go down. That way also it helps. How does one taper, last question is, how does one taper steroids, especially when given without appropriate indications? So we find this very, very often. I'm sure you also find this very, very often. I have so many old, elderly ladies who are sitting in the ha house, gaining weight, kamar dukta hai, to niche betha hua wo, ayurvedic fellow, yunani fellow, 
वो ट्यूब दे दी आप कुछ अपनी गोली दे दी एंड देन यू फाइंड दैट दे आर बिकमिंग बिगर एंड बिगर एंड क्वेश्चन ऑल एंड दिस इज समथिंग व्हिच इज सो 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 डेंजरस ऑफ कोर्स देयर आर सॉरी इट इज सो डेंजरस ऑफ कोर्स देयर आर इनफ मेडिकल रीजंस व्हाई वी पुट आवर पेशेंट्स ऑन लॉन्ग टर्म स्टीरॉइड्स एंड व्हाट हैपेंस इज दैट suddenly you stop steroids you know that the hpa axis the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis gets suppressed which exogenous steroids and i told you earlier 15 mg of prednisolone all or its equivalent for 3 months will suppress the hpa axis and in such individuals if you suddenly stop steroids they are in a state of adrenal insufficiency first is to recognize that you cannot stop them you have to taper it you have to do an 8 am cortisol value if it's more than 10 you can easily stop but some people have this uh, psychological dependence or their uh, the bone or the muscle system gets dependent on steroids so while they are okay otherwise still they feel weak tired etc where we go slowly and we have to give them instructions that even if your you have to do maybe 2 to 3 monthly cortisol till it comes to the basal cortisol is equal or more than 10 then we stop the steroids and we tell them that a sick day schedule is counseled so whenever you are ill due to any reason whatever may be the type of fever or the degrees of temperature you have to restart prednisolone maybe half a tablet three times till the fever disappears and then you stop because we all know during crisis the steroids go up two or three times their basal value these people's levels are already low and obviously will they will not be able to generate a stress response we find many many patients who are on betamethasone or dexamethasone uh, creams for some kind of skin issues those are very strong steroids so what we do in such cases that that we put them on some lighter steroid oral drugs like hydrocortisone hyson say 5 mg we monitor them allow the cortisol to go up and then we stop otherwise we are faced with these same women we so many of them they don't f- feel well after stopping the tube they go back to the same doctor who will write another tube or give some other steroids so that causes diabetes blood pressure osteoporosis so on and so forth so recognizing and then tapering of steroids with adequate levels of endogenous cortisol is the most important factor mm. well, that's what she's no, saying no. a large number of ayurvedic uh, medicines have steroids and i think uh, not the the well known ones probably who make but i think they mix up steroid powders and all that so they themselves as a herb do not have steroids you know but they mix up a lot of these medicines which causes instant relief yeah. suppose arthritis or skin disorder and and patients are not willing to stop those medicines uh, i think we'll stop here and uh, i thank dr fulreno and big applause for her for very very lucid uh, explanations thank you doctor and uh, a small moment of from us Uh, we were a little worried because she's wearing the sari that we are giving her. <laughs> a slight, slight difference in, <laughs> slight difference in the design, but yeah. We always love beautiful sari. Women who wear saris love beautiful saris, even if they are similar. Thank you so much. Thank you.
please distribute the bingo tickets. We have been having everything rapid fire today. So this is another rapid fire. It will be a rapid fire bingo for all of us. I know it is a little late, 12.40 I think. And uh, we hope to wind up at 1.15. So if you can stay back till then, we'll be happy. Uh, up the prizes. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Uh, just accompany ma'am. Uh, meanwhile, just uh, calling Dr. Mukesh and Dr. Kumar on stage. Uh, Mukesh, uh, do you want more lights or are the lights glaring in your this? Can you see the housing tickets? This is, uh, again, we, we, we are, uh, again, uh, we have worked very hard last week, harder than the previous week, and Mukesh and Kumar have both been absolutely wonderful in, uh, in you know, deadlines, wake, keeping awake till late nights and early mornings. Thank you, Mukesh. Thank you, Kumar. And we have a special uh, pri uh, gift, not prize, special gift for Rachita. Rachita here has been a <laughs> Rachita has been at the backbone, complete backbone for this event. In with <laughs> and she she has been uh, yeah without osteoporosis. Uh, Rachita, you'll help help me here uh, with the bingo. We will uh, just spread out the today's bingo. As you know, is pulmonary and gastroenterology, and uh, as we are a little short of time. We will be going as a rapid fire and I'll be asking you questions. You will be giving me the diagnosis right? and this will be quite rapid. Same prizes, first line, second line, zigzag lines starting from the bottom, zigzag lines starting from the top. Uh, those who are new, I'll just take a ticket and explain. Is there a spare ticket somewhere? Can you give me one ticket? First line gets a prize. Second line gets a prize. Zigzag means this, 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 this. Or the ulta zigzag. Two zigzags, two lines, two full houses are the six prizes. Today's prizes have been sponsored by uh, the health store. Is, is uh, Siddharth here? Siddharth is here. Please stand up, Siddharth. Can I see him? Oh, Siddhartha at the back. Thank you, Siddharth. Siddhartha has sponsored uh, multiple prizes in these two, uh, three days. And uh, uh, Siddharth, uh, who runs the health store, has brilliant equipment for people being treated at home, for acute illnesses, and for geriatric patients who are being treated at home. Many accessories for orthopedic patients. And I really think that we know very little about those those appliances that are available and we should make ourselves more knowledgeable about them. Uh, yeah, so that is about... May I start? If a bedridden person presents with acute dyspnea and a fall in SpO2 and the person refuses admission, we should do ECG and D-dimer. Why? PTE is the answer. Thrombosis. A very quick message. Bedridden patients. Two, three problems we'll be discussing. Bedridden patients calls you on video. You see the patient is breathless. You see the patient has SpO2 75, 80. Aspiration. Sorry, uh, pulmonary embolism. And D-dimer. Value is that if the D-dimer is normal, it rules out PTE. If the D-dimer is high, it supports but does not diagnose PTE. ECG, there is a pattern called S1Q3T3, which diagnoses PTE. S1 is lead 1 showing an S wave. Q3T3, lead, T, lead 3 showing a Q wave and an inverted T wave. Very peculiar of, so the diagnostic test of course is a CT angio, but you may get away with diagnosing on this and of course the clinical features of DVT may be present. Okay. 
latex foley's catheter has to be changed every 1 to 2 weeks silicon foley's catheter has to be changed every 4 to 12 weeks silicon is a material which does not uh, collect uh, concretions in the bladder more long lasting rails tube has to be changed every 4 to 6 weeks which tube may require change after 6 months peg that is feeding gastrostomy uh, your answer is fg feeding gastrostomy every 4 to 12 sorry see up to 6 months it can be kept this is one of the most underutilized procedures in the susceptible population if a person is elderly if a person is bedridden parkinsons stroke dementia alzheimers cannot swallow coughs while eating or drinking please consider and prime the relatives for a peg insertion right it's a procedure which is an outpatient procedure done by a gastroenterologist using endoscopy and you can keep the uh, keep the tube for six several months and every time the tube is changed again an endoscopy is required but it's so much more convenient to keep the patient nutritionally adequate because oral nutrition will almost never be sufficient One twenty-five to five hundred milligrams four times a day, daily, vancomycin for six, ten days. What is the diagnosis? C difficile. Your uh, answer is C dad. We discussed C difficile. My uh, my uh, request to you is C difficile associated diarrhea. C dad is not now uncommon. It's not now rare. It is uncommon. It's not rare. You must recognize it. it is easy to treat if mild with vancomycin where vancomycin is given it was initially recommended 125 mg four times a day now the dose has been increased because of the resistance up to 500 mg four times a day for about 10 days you you can treat a c dad c dad is the answer c d a d that is clostridium difficile associated diarrhea Okay, twelve percent of breast cancers, ten percent of liver cancers, eleven percent of colorectal cancers, and seven percent of esophageal cancers occur due to alcohol. C two H five O H is the answer on your sheet. Liver cancer only ten percent, but breast cancer twelve percent. alcohol related cancers are plentiful all the uh, so this is something that the youngsters need to be probably told more because they are starting alcohol at a younger age and becoming more regular as they grow older and both liver cirrhosis occurs in women at a lower dose of alcohol consumption and breast cancer of course is a risk factor in 2010 a study called the panther study concluded that patients taking corticosteroids plus azathioprine plus n acetylcysteine had an increased risk of deaths in which disease in which disease ipf idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis now this is a remarkable change we have been killing patients till the till 2010 it is it was an established treatment form to give patients of ipf that is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis it was an established thing to give them corticosteroids to give them azathioprine with n acetylcysteine and this triple drug combination which was the standard of care at that time was prone to be harmful causing more icu admissions causing more deaths which is when this completely went away this is ipf so two two new drugs came into being for ipf i'll be talking a little more about ild ipf is a form of interstitial lung disease a very specific form of interstitial lung disease where nintadanib nintadanib and pyrfenidone are useful
The six food elimination diet is typically employed in this disease. The six food elimination diet is typically employed in which disease? No. IBS name. IBS is low FODMAPS diet. In six food elimination diet is employed in eosinophilic gastroenteritis. This is an entity which is less known, not very common, but eosinophilic gastroenteritis can affect esophagus, small intestine, stomach, and large intestine. Eosinophilic gastroenteritis is diagnosed usually by uh, patients with chronic symptoms of GI tract, including heartburn, etc. And these patients on endoscopic biopsy of say the esophagus will show tissue eosinophilia, eosinophilia in the tissues. The etiology is not well known. It's supposed to be some form of allergy because it involves eosinophils and food allergy is suspected. So there is a six food elimination diet. And what are the six foods? Milk, wheat, that is gluten, egg, nuts, soy, and fish. These are the six foods eliminated in first in patients with suspected eosinophilic disease. So milk, wheat, egg, nuts, soy, fish. Wheat, milk, egg, nuts, soy, fish. And if, so after six weeks, if there is no improvement in the biopsy of the eosinophilic tissue, then medicines are tried. Steroids are one medicine that are tried in eosinophilic gastroenteritis. There are oral steroids which are non-absorbable are also tried like budesonide. Capsules are tried which don't get absorbed. So in esophageal disease, some patients are given those inhalers of steroids like foracort or budesonide which they have to swallow instead of inhaling. They put the pump in their mouth and gulp the pump rather than inhale the pump. And now there are newer therapies which are come in the form of monoclonal antibodies. So there are many, but this is a disease which is not yet fully defined in etiology and therapy. What to? Ah, what to mark? EEG, eosinophilic gastroenteritis. Why EEG? I don't know. But EEG. In a person presenting with dyspnea at rest, wheezing, and history of both coronary heart disease and COPD, both. If the anti P is in several thousands, what do you think of? Cardiac asthma, CA. Now this is a very common problem. Again, a telephonic consultation. Patients will be acutely breathless at home. Patient is a known case of asthma COPD. Patient is a known case of heart disease, has had an ejection fraction of 35%. And now the patient is dyspneic at rest, orthopnic, is sitting up. You have to give some first aid to the patient before the patient. So you will the, say by nebulization, lelo, elastics, lelo. also simultaneously, you please send immediately the NT pro BNP. NT pro BNP is a useful investigation in breathless patients breathless at rest patients and breathless on exertion patients. Anti-proBNP basically in high anti-proBNP indicates cardiac failure. Okay. Uh, CA, that was CA. Okay. One disease that you can treat with parental antibiotics at home does not require admission always which involves perforation of the bowel and causes left iliac fossa pain is diverticulitis, sigmoid diverticulitis. Now, this is a very interesting situation. Sigmoid diverticulitis causes pain. Diverticulosis is basically an outpouching. Infection in the diverticulum is called diverticulitis. Diverticulum can occur anywhere in the bowel, esophagus everywhere. But sigmoid diverticulum is the one that gets infected the most commonly. Sigmoid diverticulitis presents with left lower quadrant pain and fever and what is called as obstipation. Severe obstructive constipation. Patient can't pass flatus, patient can't pass 
stool. Occasionally there is loose motions, more commonly obstipation. When a patient comes with this, and these patients are elderly because diverticulosis basically is a disease of the older people. When the patient comes to you with this condition, you will see the WBC count will go high. You do a sonography, patient will uh, be reported as peri sigmoid colon, yeah, peri colic inflammation or fat stranding on the ultrasound and occasionally a small pocket of air. This pocket of air is due to micro perforation of the sigmoid colon. Micro perforation is sealed off by the mesentery. So it doesn't become a large perforation with gas under the diaphragm, small perforation. These patients, if clinically stable, can be managed with IV antibiotics at home. You will have to keep them nil by mouth, give some IV fluids at home, but they recover very fast. Maybe the first episode you will admit, but these patients can have recurrent diverticulitis and these patients you will have to, may have to conserve at home. How do they prevent recurrent diverticulitis? By fiber. Every day these patients, after they have recovered, should receive fiber uh, in the form of satisab, uh, isabgula, etc. And that may prevent further uh, episodes. Abbreviation is DIV. DIV, diverticulitis. Which disease has a preventive intranasal vaccine and a therapeutic intranasal drug? Which disease? Preventive intranasal vaccine and th huh? influenza. IF, influenza. In the West, they have a nasal vaccine. In India, a nasal vaccine has been recently introduced. It's a live vaccine for preventing influenza, chiefly used in, useful in children, uh, but it can be used by anybody except pregnant women because it's a live vaccine. And there is an intranasal treatment in the form of relenza. Relenza is a drug, Xanamivir, which is uh, uh, used to treat influenza, not available currently here, but does become available during severe pandemics. IF for influenza. Again, a bedridden patient. We had a bedridden patient who had um, cardiac asthma. Now, this is a bedridden patient and pulmonary embolism also we discussed, right? Now, here is a third bedridden patient who starts coughing and desaturates but recovers within a few minutes. Sudden cough, sudden desaturation and after half an hour, aspiration. What kind of aspiration? This is usually either aspiration of water or a chemical aspiration of stomach contents. These two aspirations recover very fast. The patients are panicking, they have called the ambulance, the ambulance has already arrived, they are about to take the patient, the patient recovers. And whenever an aspiration occurs at home, be on the video call or go on the visit, if you think that the aspirin is not infectious, and if the patient aspirated food, for example, or even vomitus, for example, the patient will probably recover very fast within minutes or maximum hours. So not all aspirations require hospitalization. If an alcoholic aspirates, if a person with severely bad teeth uh, infection aspirates with anaerobic organisms, then they will have an infection, infective aspiration pneumonia. But a chemical aspiration pneumonia which is gastric contents ka aspiration pneumonia is chemical, then they may not require hospitalization and waiting and watching, especially for a very elderly patient who is difficult to move, you may see that they recover. They don't even require antibiotics. Abbreviation, AP, aspiration pneumonia. Nothing? Ek bhi nahi hai, das ho das khali hai, Achha. Dimag bhar gaya. Dimag, full empty ke liye price nahi hai. Yeah. Wo bol na, dimag bhara hai, ticket khali hai, chalega. Okay. Uh, uh, we will continue till, till uh, we get the prizes sorted or till uh, you are completely unsorted uh, and uh, we will leave.
Okay, which variant of asthma can worsen with trap? Trap is traffic related air pollution. That is the official abbreviation of trap. Which variant of asthma can worsen with trap such that 40% of patients will progress to classic asthma in three to five years? What am I talking about? Cough variant asthma, CVA. Now this is an important condition, important disease. CVA is asthma which uh, so cough variant asthma is asthma where cough is the predominant symptom. Dyspnea or wheeze does not occur. And this cough also responds to inhalational therapy. And this cough of course is related to pollution a lot and it will worsen within a few years to classic asthma and pollution. In, in Mumbai of course, the BMC is making a halabaloo about construction sites. But in Mumbai, the chief cause of respiratory disease related to, asthma, related to pollution is trap. Traffic related air pollution. So if you want to kind of move somewhere, you have to move away from traffic, not just away from construction sites. Okay. This was CVA. Okay. As we uh, spoke with Dr. Uh, Tanu Singhal, if you have a community acquired pneumonia, meaning patient comes to you with fever, rigors maybe for one day, patient has cough, maybe with rusty sputum, pleuritic pain, classic pneumonia features, and the patient's x-ray shows pneumonia. The recommendation is to start with both therapies. Therapy for typical pneumonia and atypical pneumonia. Typical pneumonia organism, the commonest is pneumococcus. Atypical pneumonia, the commonest is mycoplasma. And so therefore, they advise starting with amoxicillin and azithromycin both. I tend to uh, uh, differ a bit. There are clinically some things that are very typical of pneumococcal pneumonia. If the patient is lobar consolidation with air bronchogram on x-ray, if the patient is coughing up rusty sputum, if the patient has pleuritic chest pain, if the patient has shadows only on one side, because bronchial atypical causes shadows on both sides often, then you can be fairly certain that this is pneumococcus. And do away with azithromycin and just give amoxicillin is what I believe. But the recommendations from the US are that you do give both. The answer is atypical pneumonia, where of course I was saying uh, that you should cover with azithromycin. In the West, they give levofloxacin. But in India, we don't give levofloxacin. AP for atypical pneumonia. Sorry, ATP hai. ATP hai, ATP hai. Okay. Which complication is less common with NASH or alcohol related cirrhosis than with HBV or HCV related cirrhosis? HCC is the correct answer. HCC. An important thing to know here is that 25% of HCC in NASH occurs in the absence of cirrhosis. So NASH need not progress to cirrhosis and then become CA, HCC. NASH can directly progress to uh, HCC. One line. Can you please stand up and announce the line and announce your name also? Wonderful. And your name please? Shobna. Shobna gets the first line. First line or second line? First line. First line. A big round of applause for Shobna please. How many of you right now want to go home? Raise your hands. Right now. Not so many. Thank you. Um, if a person comes to you with ptosis and right shoulder and arm pain, you look for wasting of thinner muscles. Ptosis, one eye. Right arm pain, right shoulder pain. Look for thinner muscle uh, atrophy and diagnose what? 
what do you diagnose sorry pancos tumor excellent pancos tumor now this is an uncommon disease but it is easy to recognize in the opd pancos tumor is a tumor of the it's a superior sulcus tumorous the uppermost part of the lung so your answer is apex on your ticket uppermost part of the lung gets the tumor this tumor compresses on the brachial plexus it causes pain arm shoulder and cat1 region may it causes thinner eminence flattening or atrophy it also causes something called horner syndrome where you get ptosis meiosis narrow smaller pupil and and hydrosis on the side of the face it is easy to recognize ptosis it is easy to complain of shoulder pain and then you have to see this the thinner eminence and x rays might miss the lung cancer with a small area a ct scan will never miss or mri will never miss apex sorry A P E X apex. If a patient of atrial fibrillation comes to you with cough, dyspnea, and lung shadows on X-ray chest, the lung shadows on H R C T are described as non-specific interstitial pneumonia (N S I P). What do you think of? Amiodarone toxicity. Amiodarone toxicity. I L D. Drug induced I L D. so they answer it d i i drug induced ild now three drugs that are very important for us to monitor for interstitial lung disease three drugs one is amiodarone as we discussed with dr amitwara last time amiodarone is sometimes continued unnecessarily for li life because if it is not controlling meaning it not converting the rhythm to sinus we don't give it only for rate control because for rate control we have delta as m beta blockers etc please stop the amiodarone if it is not converting the atrial fibrillation to sinus rhythm and continuation of amiodarone can cause multiple problems eye toxicity lung toxicity hypothyroidism sometimes hyperthyroidism so these problems will occur the second drug that we need to know is nitrofurantoin nitrofurantoin in the elderly if given for several months can cause interstitial lung disease and can also cause hepatotoxicity and the third drug that we should know is in rheumatoid arthritis methotrexate is given methotrexate is of course given for several years and methotrexate can cause similarly an interstitial lung disease that was dii if a person with copd has worsening dyspnea disorientation and flapping tremors what do you think of you think of co2 narcosis to so your answer is co2 one very uh, so i go back again and again to telephonic consultation because such a lot of things can be done on the telephone where a very sick patient does not need to come to you or you don't need to visit the patient and you can direct the patient directly to the hospital on a video consultation if a copd known case of copd has worsening dyspnea and this patient has little slurring of speech disorientation do a video call ask the relatives to make his hand go up and if the hand goes like this these are called flaps and flaps will mean that the patient of copd has become has co2 carbon dioxide narcosis many causes of flaps not just co2 if a patient is a cardiac patient on diuretics flaps can be due to hyponatremia for example if a patient is a uh, ckd patient and ckd patient has flaps that means his creatinine has suddenly risen significantly and this is uremic flaps so many causes of flaps which you can hospitalize for and all these patients will require hospitalization will sorry and क्या था आंसर सीओ टू जिग्जैक हो सॉरी जिग्जैक जिग्जैक प्लीज अनाउंस वाओ एंड योर नेम प्लीज अर्षि अर्षि 
with zigzag starting from the top starting from the left top left top left top ka zigzag hai ye piche walon ki seat mein kuch khas tiktet di gayi hain women reservation ho raha hai course uh, women's day hai acha ha ye abhi aaya next uh, uip co2 UIP unresponsive to corticosteroids and immunosuppressants. UIP is what is UIP? Anybody? Usual intestinal pneumonia. UIP is usually unresponsive to steroids. So UIP मार मेरा full form क्या है मालूम है? Usual intestinal interstitial pneumonia नहीं है. Usually ineffective prednisolone. ऐसे याद रखने का. Steroids are useless in UIP, and so are azathioprine, etc. Whereas NSIP and COP are responsive to corticosteroids. NSIP का full form बताइए. Non-specific interstitial pneumonia. COP का बताइए. COP, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. These are all CT scan diagnoses. They are basically histopathologic diagnosis, but they are all CT scan diagnosis. So when your patient of what is called interstitial lung disease comes with a CT scan to you, your job is to see what is the description of CT scan. Is it NSIP? Is it hypersensitivity pneumonia? Is it COP? Is it IPF? I mean, is it UIP? UIP is equal to IPF. Then you will know whether the steroids that have been given by some other doctor are going to be useful or need to be stopped. Correct. So uh, the answer here is ILD. ILD. There are various forms of ILD. ILD is one of the tougher subjects for the family physician. My, I have two line suggestion on this. If a person older than fifty. Presents to you with dry cough, exertional dyspnea. You do the six-minute walk test. The saturation falls below 88 percent. Your clinical diagnosis, especially if the patient is clubbing, is ILD. Send the patient for a CT scan. The CT scan picture, NSIP, UIP, etc., will give you a guidance. Refer the patient to the pulmonologist. This much you should do. Because the follow-up is going to be with you, this much you should do. Suspect, do a CT scan. One twenty. It is one twenty. My daughter is warning me that it is one twenty. But uh, they are not budging. They are not budging. No, no. She is. She is very dedicated. She will not go, and she has no interest in cricket. Okay. Uh, They have an extra. Okay, they have an extra after that. So 1:30 is our cutoff. Uh, we'll be quicker, right? Which disease is classified as stricture-producing, non-stricture, non-penetrating, or penetrating? Which disease is classified as stricture-producing, penetrating, non-stricture-producing, non-penetrating? Crohn's. Crohn's. Very. Uh, Crohn's. Ka ek hi message hai aapke liye. कि क्रोन्स डिजीज प्रेजेंट्स विथ टीबी लाइक फीचर्स मीनिंग क्रोन्स में लो ग्रेड फीवर वेट लॉस एब्डोमिनल पेन ऑन सोनोग्राफी दे विल शो इन्फ्लेमेशन ऑफ द बॉबल स्पेशली द टर्मिनल आइलियम सम लिम्फ नोट्स इन द मेजेंट्री एंड यू विल थिंक टीबी मस्ट एज वी सेड टिश्यू डायग्नोसिस ऑफ टीबी मैंडेटरी ऑल सच क्रोन्स डिजीज पेशेंट मस्ट अंडर गो फर्दर इन्वेस्टिगेशन द क्लिंचिंग डायग्नोसिस दे डू एन कोलोनोस्कोपी From the colonoscope, they will enter the terminal ileum, biopsy, and give you the diagnosis of Crohn's disease. So Crohn's is a treatable, controllable problem, and must diagnose. Don't treat as TB. The answer is CD. Sorry, lower line. Just answer the. Uh, what's your name, sir? Urmil Dedia, you get your prize. A big round of applause.
okay quickly last two or three and lower line done anybody else lower line nobody one more lower line don't need to announce but you'll get a prize uh, congratulations again to you next word 25% of patients with this cause of acute abdomen have a stone and hence have to be operated i'll repeat 25% of these patients presenting with acute abdominal pain have a stone and hence have to be operated any guesses pancreatitis nahi cholecystitis mein sab ko stone hota hai 100% ko hota hai na matlab if they have a stone acute appendicitis a a is your answer this is a stone that we rarely talk about a a mein acute appendicitis mein acute appendicitis if there is an appendicolith at the lumen of the appendix that appendicolith will not allow conservative therapy meaning you can't uh, you can't say okay antibiotics denge aur ho jayega many such patients have recurrences or worsening with rupture you must all appendicolith reported sonography sonography or ct scan will pick up the appendicolith you must operate yep ha kya hua lower zigzag done uh, ma'am your name chandrani dr chandrani big give her a big hand please okay La last maybe uh what is mash hey bhai udhar hi rehna bhai full house ho gaya zigzag zigzag ho gaya dono claim ho gaya dono claim ho gaya <laughs> mish mash <laughs> mash mash is the new name for nash what is nash non alcoholic steroid hepatitis lower line is done front line is done all lines are done right zigzag nahi hua ho gaya ab bhi liya udhar kisi ne sir ne liya dono abhi khali full out baki fatafat mash mash is the new name for metabolic associated steroid hepatitis and this is a new name for nash why the non alcoholic did not give the etiology non alcoholic matlab kya तो नाउ वी नो दैट मेटाबॉलिक सिंड्रोम के साथ जो फैटी लिवर होता है और उसमें अगर इन्फ्लेमेशन होता है तो इट इज कॉल्ड मैश एंड अगर इन्फ्लेमेशन नहीं है तो इट इज कॉल्ड एम ए एस एल डी जो भी आपको फुल फॉर्म लेना हो एम ए एस एल डी राइट ओके वी दैट वॉज मैश एंड ए ए नाउ नेक्स्ट If a person presents with an AEC of more than 1,500, absolute eosinophil count of more than 1,500 over six months at least, despite your DEC treatment, despite deworming, what is the label given to such a person? What disease? Hyper eosinophilic syndrome. Tropical eosinophilia basically is something that responds to diethyl carbamazine, DEC, heterazine. when a patient does not respond your diagnosis hyper eosinophilic syndrome why is it important to know this disease this can be a malignancy of the bone marrow is so you have to refer refer all eosinophilias more than 1500 not responding over several months to a hematologist that you must do this is one condition which we miss regularly abbreviation hs hs if a diabetic on oral antidiabetics comes to you with recent increase in episodes of urti dp remember this so many urtis are happening in these months just check if the patient is on a dpp4 inhibitor like linagliptin sidagliptin tenagliptin dpp4 inhibitors come with a warning that there is an increase in urti due to dpp4 okay abbreviations dpp4 and ek full house ka last try mar lete if a person with bmi of 
presents with hypertension which is uncontrolled despite four groups of drugs and has an REI of more than 15. What is the diagnosis? In the, uh, REI of more than 15. Diagnosis? OSA. REI is a new term for AHI. AHI, apnea, hypopnea index. REI, respiratory event index. That is the word used uh, as a substitute to our AI. So some reports will not mention AHI. They will mention REI. Remember, even with a BMI of 21, if a patient comes with uncontrolled, difficult to control hypertension, think of obstructive sleep apnea. Lean obstructive sleep apnea is an entity that we see in India. Thin people with OSA is not rare. So you must think of that. Uh, Okay, abbreviation OSA tha. Pula ho gaya. Aapka naam batayin? Anita ji. Please give uh, Anita. Uh, I, okay. There are some words left and we will try to give them on the what, on WhatsApp. Uh, even the last time ke kuch words rege the. We'll, next time, uh, I, we saw the similar population coming in today, so I'm glad. And next time, please be here Sunday, 9 o'clock. Thank you so much.